think we can go ahead and get started. Do you think so, Sophie? Yes, I think so. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Churchill Hines. I'm the chair of the board for the Vermont State Colleges, calling to order a special meeting of the board, duly called for uh, August 12th at one in the afternoon. This meeting is being held through Zoom conference and is also being shared via YouTube live stream. We have a very important and busy agenda today. It will include an executive session shortly, but we do not anticipate that uh, the executive, se executive session will be a lengthy one. And then we will proceed through um, both uh, routine business, such as the reports from the Finance Committee and special topics regarding um, uh, Title IX and, and related issues, as well as the VCS uh, VSCCS forward task force initial recommendations and hearing from our new colleague and ally Jim Page in Maine. But before we go any further, I have a personal announcement I'd like to make. Today, I will be stepping down as your chair and retiring from the Vermont State College's board. There is rarely a good time or a right time for these actions. Nonetheless, I think I could make a sound argument that fresh new board leadership should parallel and support the fresh new systems leadership being shown by her, by Sophie, her team, including member, many new members of the Chancellor's senior team, and of course, by our presidents and deans and others across the system. In addition to that, uh, there have been some quite persuasive personal voices that are also urging me to make this decision. I'm in my 20th year as a trustee, over two terms, if you will, the first beginning in 1987 and then returning to the board in 2015. 20 years is the longest relationship in my life with anything other than my family. Others might say it's taken me an awfully long time to graduate, but I share that with many of our students who experience the same thing. Many of you know I kind of look at the world through numbers. I have served under five governors. Each of those governors and I have been able to develop a first name relationship that last to this day whenever I see them. What a gift to an old Vermonter. I've worked with over 60 trustees, five board chairs. Going back to Chancellor Dick Bjork in the early 1980s, I have worked with five, not now I'm sorry, with Sophie, with six chancellors of the VSC. Roughly 20 different college and university presidents. I've attended 40-something commencement ceremonies and have celebrated over 20,000 new VSC graduates. The VSC mission to benefit Vermont came naturally to me. My family has seven generations in this grand little state. And when I was tapped on the shoulder and asked if I had something to offer, I was more than happy to do so and I would encourage like-minded Vermonters to watch for opportunities in your lives to make a commitment as well as each of our trustees have made and who are attending today. The college's mission has a way of embedding itself in your cellular level, and it will be there with me forever. So today's my graduation day. Finally, I will be a VSC grad. And I thank sincerely the current trustees that I'm serving with, as well as all of those that have be with, been with me prior to this, to Sophie, our absolutely stellar new chancellor. How in the world did we be, could we be so fortunate to have you in this role, Sophie? Mm. To our gifted presidents, President Judy, President Collins, President Moulton, President Spiro, hundreds of committed and 
talented faculty and staff, and thousands upon thousands of students. Thank you to, uh, thank you to all of you who support our grand VSC system. It has been a great honor and a great pleasure. And I will treasure these memories of 20 years with the VSC forever. I would ask Trustee Dickinson if she could present a motion that would bring us into executive session. Again, we don't expect this will take very long and then we will return to the board's business. Trustee Dickinson. No, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Church. Uh, I move the VSC Board of Trustees enter executive session pursuant to one VSA section 313 subsection A3 to discuss the appointment of a public official. The committee shall make a final decision on any such public official in an open meeting and shall explain the reasons for this final decision during the open meeting. Along with the members of the board present at this meeting, in its discretion, the board invites the chancellor to attend. So moved. Do we have a second? I'll second that. We have a second from a Adam Grenold. Any discussion? Adam. Uh, how will we be going into this session? I, is there a, a link or are we being moved into it? Breakout room, you'll get an invite Adam. on your screen. Okay, thank you, Adam. Look for Dylan as well on the phone. Just out of curiosity. Dylan is here. Yeah, but he's on the phone. I don't know if that works for him to enter the breakout room. Yes, it does. Okay. Then all those in favor of entering executive session for the purposes as described in the motion by Trancy, uh, Trustee Dickinson, please say aye. 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 Opposed. We will go into executive session and be back before too long. Thank you. Okay, as I said, we have returned from executive session. No action was taken during executive session. But we do have an action item related to that session and Trustee Grinold will now make that motion. Thank you. Uh, I would move a slate of officers as follows. Chair, Trustee Dickinson, Vice Chair, Trustee Kluver, Secretary, Trustee Lanou, with Trustee Silverman to remain. Do we have a second? Second from uh, second. Pichek. Thank you, Michael. Is there any discussion? Uh, Trustee Dickinson. Yes, I just want to say thanks to Church for all of his hard work and full-time commitment to this position as chair. Uh, you leave very big, very big shoes for me to, to walk in, and I appreciate all of the things that you've done. You've reached out to me and given me support as vice chair, and, and you have really been um, gone above and beyond. You have spoken to presidents of colleges and board chairs of other colleges and received a lot of advice on a lot of issues that we face, and I just want to say that you know the work ethic and the effort you've made is just peculiar, just huge. And I know that this is the second time around, and I'm sorry to see you leave so soon because you really were a very, um, a very knowledgeable institutional memory oriented person who understood a lot of the history of the institutions and the people. So as uh, I know I don't have the ability or the, um, or really even the time to go to, go to this that you did, but I just wanna say thank you very, very much. Appreciate that, Lynn. My, my faith tradition stresses the importance of atonement. And so this has been an opportunity to atone for a rebellious youth. And I think I've just about squared the tables. I think we're, we're about back to where I can have a rebel, rebellious elderly period and see what comes after that. Is there further discussion? Michael. Thanks, Church. I just wanted to echo Lynn's uh, sentiments and say thank you very much for your for your work on behalf of the board. I, I know when uh, Martha stepped down as board chair a few years ago, I didn't think anyone could 
you know, fill her shoes. And you did that ably. And I know Martha would be proud of the work that you have accomplished um, over the last few years. And um, just want to thank you. That means a great deal. Martha's been a role model for a lot of things in life. Jim, the middle bencher. Yeah, the middle bencher. Um, just to be short, when they let us back into Julio's again, church, I'd be glad to buy you a beer. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you, church. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, let's proceed with a vote, if we can, on the on the motion as made by Trustee Grinnell, establishing uh, Lynn Dickinson as chair, uh, Megan Kluver as vice chair, Karen Luno returning to her role as secretary, and David Silverman continuing in his role as board treasurer. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have adopted the resolution. Congratulations, Lynn. No, thank you. I get, I get the gavel now, right? <laughs> Passing it over to you. <laughs> she can't wait. <laughs> OK, well, we do have a full agenda. And um, I'm going to start with the approval of the minutes from July 6th of 2020. Uh, I'm looking for a, a, a motion to accept the minutes as read. Or corrections? Sure. Okay, Jim has made the motion. Would someone like to second that? I'll second it. Adam will second that. Um, any comment, any corrections, any any omissions, anything in there that needs to be changed? Seeing none. Oh, all those uh, Wishing to support the uh, minutes of July 6th, please say aye. 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 Any no's? Okay, the minutes have passed. Um, we now have um, Jeffrey Nolan here, who is an attorney who will be going over the policy 311 and 311A. These are the, um, the things that we need to change or update on our Title IX regulations. Um, I'll turn to the chancellor and she can introduce uh, the attorney and we can go from there. Yes, can you hear me? Okay. And I apologize for the audio. So welcome, Jeff. Thanks so <laughs> see you again. So Jeff and I actually worked together before I came to the VSC, but Jeff has really built a national reputation and a national practice on Title IX issues and on other issues, but specifically on Title IX. And then given all the transitions we've had this summer, uh, we asked Jeff to um, take a look at our policy 311A and revise it in accordance with uh, the new Title IX regulations that came down in May. I know I've been flagging this for, for the trustees as something that was coming that we needed to do. Uh, the deadline is on Friday, the 14th. Um, so it's terrible timing because not just for us, but for across the country, a ridiculously short amount of time um, to enact these uh, new policies and procedures when people are dealing with the pandemic and, and we're not even together to talk about things. So uh, we're very appreciative to Jeff for stepping in and helping us out. He did have some familiarity already with our policy 311 and 311A. So probably not quite as heavy a lift as it might be if he was coming from the outside. But uh, thank you so much, Jeff. And we look forward to being educated about our, our new policies and uh, the Title IX regulations. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thanks for having me today. I do really appreciate it. I've had the opportunity to work with some of you in capacities at the VSC and some in other places, and it's just really nice to see everyone. Um, my office is in Boston now. I was at, uh, in Vermont till last summer. Now my office is in Boston, although I haven't been to that office since March because <laughs> they shut it down as well as shutting down all the other firms. The, office, the firm has offices all over the country, but they're all closed and I'm happily, so the, the trees you see behind me are in fact uh, Vermont trees. Um, and so I've been happily here since, since March, which is a, a nice way to spend your summer. It's just fine with me not to be driving back and forth. So it's really quite nice, um, despite the, the terrible circumstances we find ourselves in. And um, as Sophie said, the timing of this couldn't really be much worse. I guess you could say that for virtually anything um, as it affects 
affects higher ed and the and the COVID responses and our return to campus plans and and all of that. But here we are. Department of Ed made clear that they wanted to move forward um, with uh, these new regulations and that the effective date was going to be basically as soon as they could possibly implement them. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't particularly need it, um, but um, Patty, we had worked on a PowerPoint. If it's something that um, is pulled up on your end, that's fine. If you need me to do it, I suppose I could, although I don't know that I'm screen sharing at the moment. Um, but just give me a yell if you want me to do that. We, we did share your PowerPoint with the trustees, but it would be obviously better if we could if we could have them up on the screen would be helpful for everyone else. Um, so I don't know if Jen or Meg can assist with that or make you the a host where you can share it. Okay, hold on one second. You should be able to share if you'd like to. Okay, hold on one second then. Well, that's going to take a few minutes to come through. That's fine. Um, and I don't, I don't need it. Here we go. Just give me one second and I'll pull it up. I, I can just add by way of background, um, you know, for the trustees and for anyone else that's listening. Uh, we had two policies going into this policy 311, which was our non-discrimination um, harassment and related uh, unprofessional conduct. And then we had 311A, which we created back in 2014 in response to the guidance that came out of the Obama administration. And that dealt specifically with sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, um, and other sexual misconduct. So with the new regulations, we've had to kind of mix and match a little bit here as Title IX did straddle both policies. So just by way of introduction, and looks like we're good to go. Okay, there we go. Okay, so it's, I've pretty much been living and breathing this stuff. I, as Sophie said, I work with schools around the country on these issues and um, all, all have been working in their own way to move forward. Um, Todd Delos reached out quite a while ago. I would say that VSC is relatively organized on these issues, which is nice because there is a lot to do and a lot that we need to be cognizant of. Um, big philosophical issues for campuses was how much of their prior uh, practice were they going to retain? And that'll be pretty much the theme as we go through here. Um, I, it is safe to say that the Vermont State Colleges has chosen to retain the manner in which it um, protects its community, prohibits mis uh, certain misconduct on campus, um, really has not uh, changed those protections, has not um, taken the uh, invitation of the federal government to uh, narrow the scope of what is known as sexual harassment, but also includes sexual assault and other matters as we'll talk about, has really stuck with the same prohibitions it has had, but has had to implement some new procedures that will give you some sense of um, in order to comply with the new mandates. So again, August 14th uh, deadline, there is a potential for injunction, but uh, one of those motions uh, in the Southern District of New York, uh, action filed by uh, the Attorney General in New York and probably some colleges as well, um, was already denied. And um, others are pending, um, but here we are two days out. Um, I'd be surprised if it's enjoined, but anything can happen. Um, even if it isn't joined, we're in a world where there's expectations around what schools are going to do process-wise, particularly with public institutions like uh, VSC. So, you know, the injunctions, we'll just have to see what they say, if any, is issued. What we know is, is that, the, that the, the heavy lifting has been done to change the policies as necessary. Um, a lot of the back and forth has involved um, questions around, um, around how far should schools go 
with um, protecting one constituency or another is how people put it in a polar environment. I, I tend to think it's not so polar as the media might portray it to be because really when we do the hard work on our campuses, we see that these cases tend to be very nuanced and difficult and there's a lot of gray area. It's not so much where it's easily uh, uh, cut and dry as to what is right and what is wrong. Um, obviously sexual assault, stalking, dating violence, domestic violence are horribly wrong, but it's not always easy in our cases to see what has actually happened when we look at the facts in front of us. 2011, the Department of Education uh, moved forward with uh, efforts by guidance to say that more should be done to protect complainants, people who report that they've been subjected to uh, sexual violence um, without particular interest or, or attention paid to respondents' rights because traditionally respondents had had the rights, again, particularly at public institutions like BSC, guaranteed by the Constitution to notice and an opportunity to be heard, to um, address issues that have been brought forward, whereas complainants were treated essentially as witnesses um, and witnesses alone. And the 2011 Dear Colleague letter changed that and further emphasis in 2014 um, uh, further uh, strengthened that emphasis and strengthened that objective. There were arguments that it was making things less safe for respondents and less appropriate, uh, that things were unfairly shifting. I don't particularly ascribe to those arguments. I think that schools were probably seeing more reports because there was more confidence in uh, systems that were better uh, adapt enabled and adapted to the needs of um, reporting parties as well as uh, respondents. But be that as it may, there's been a lot of political back and forth on these issues and the courts have weighed in and said at times that schools didn't follow procedures that they should have. Um, the Department of Education under the new administration has shifted focus and said, number one, we don't think guidance is the way to go. We think formal rulemaking is the way to go. They announced that in 2017 at the time that they withdrew some prior guidance. They then followed a process that started in November of 2018, where they floated new regs for comment by the public, received over 125,000 or around 125,000 comments. Um, they had to address those comments in 2,000 pages of preamble to the new regulations. They attempted to do so. The current lawsuits are battling over whether they did it effectively or whether the, what they adopted was appropriate under Title IX. We'll see how that hashes out. In the meantime, what we've done is we have um, amended a uh, proposed amendment subject to your review in the policy realm um, to the VSC policies to address what the new regulations require because we're being realistic about where we are. Um, one thing emphasized, Title IX always did this, but it's stronger than ever. Um, Title IX is about prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex in federally funded programs we often think about issues related to these matters uh, that affect uh, students, but they affect employees as well. And Title IX covers employees as well. And that's brought out in the new regulations, which also cover employees explicitly. Um, prior ones did, but they didn't say anything particularly controversial. So much more attention is being focused on that now. The new regulations focus the scope of sexual harassment that schools could choose to prohibit. And they say, this is what the Department of Education is going to be um, enforcing and investigating. Um, the new regulations increase procedural requirements. That has to be applied across the board. We have some uh, leeway as to what we do with what we prohibit. Narrower definition, you've probably read about this. Quid pro quo harassment is covered, always was under VSC policies and state law effectively and federal law in exchange um, uh, having to do with sexual behavior is quite clearly sexual harassment. A heightened standard for hostile environment sexual harassment, it's in the middle of the screen, severe, pervasive, objectively offensive, heightened from severe or persistent or pervasive. Um, seems like a subtle change, but it's gonna have a difference in practice for schools that only adopt this, but VSC is doing more. And then sexual assault. And um, sexual assault and other issues defined in the Cleary Act include not just um, rape and fondling without consent as defined in the Cleary Act, which is your statistics law and your campus safety disclosure law, 
but also uh, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. Those are things we dealt with before because as of 2015, we had to as higher ed institutions that receive federal funds. Now they're being pulled into the Title IX definition as well. So the rules about how those are addressed are even more prescriptive than they used to. The scope of where you have to be, have to be, I know re regulating has narrowed as well. Department of Education now saying it's only a Title IX sexual harassment matter if it happens within the school's education program or activity. And you see the language here, conduct that occurs at a location, event, circumstance, where there's control, substantial control over both the respondent, the person reported to have engaged in the misconduct, and the context. This clarifies some previous ambiguity on these points that wasn't um, always well answered by previous guidance. This is helpful in terms of saying what we must address. But again, VSC is going to go broader because we can. Against a person in the United States, if it's going to be Title IX, those words are in the statute. So they're saying if it's Title IX, it's got to be involving an occurrence in the United States. So a study abroad issue or something that happens on a, on a trip to Canada or what have you would not be covered by Title IX, but we can still cover it if we choose to under broader policies. And that's the way your policies have been written. So we have this language, um, uh, domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking are covered. Sexual exploitation is something broader than sexual. It may be sexual harassment, but it doesn't always need to be. Typically, sexual exploitation involves um, it's taking undue unfair sexual advantage of someone or the benefit of anyone but the person taken advantage of. It often involves um, video recording, audio recording, um, without consent, sharing of video of sexual activity or nudity without consent. Um, so those are things that may or may not be sexual harassment covered by Title IX. But even though they're, they may not be, the state colleges have said, this is still behavior as it was before that we are going to prohibit in our community and we're going to hold people to a higher standard than the federal law requires. So that's something that's still in there. Um, there's an expanded definition of retaliation. We'll get into that in a second that we must apply now, which is, which is fine. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not a problematic thing. It's going to be protective of the community, so that's not a problem. There is some nuance around requiring people to participate that we'll discuss in a minute. We've neutralized some of the terms uh, previously, and this was borrowing from Cleary language, so it wasn't something that we were, were making up. There was use of terms like victim or survivor, really tried to make that more generic to complainant, which is, sounds legalistic, but it is more accurate because in the course of a policy like this, we haven't made a conclusion as we're investigating as to whether someone is a victim or survivor of, of a sexual assault because we have not yet concluded that one has occurred. However, of course, when working with someone who comes forward, your support offices, counselors, and so on, they're gonna use different terms that are more empathic, that are more appropriate for that setting. Um, but when we write a policy like this, we use the more legalistic terms to convey the neutrality that we really have to have across the board. Again, respondent rather than criminal justice type language, like a, a offender or alleged perpetrator, that's something that we do across the board as well. Um, so we've got two different definitions now. We, for reasons way too obscure and boring to get into, I will spare you, but we basically have to say we have Title IX sexual harassment, and then we have non-Title IX sexual misconduct. So what we are able to do by having these two categories is have conduct that's defined by the law uh, within our program or activity in the United States be prohibited and addressed through certain procedures, but also we can prohibit conduct that is outside program or activity, but still has enough of a connection to the VSC that the institutions feel like they should be regulating it, you know, off-campus conduct between students uh, or something that happens in a study abroad program of the institution in another country, we want to be able to address that. So that's something that we have the ability to address or these things like sexual exploitation, where it's not literally sexual harassment under Title IX, but we still want to prohibit it. That's something that we absolutely can do under this other category. The, the way we do it is a little bit different. Um, again, we already have this list that's going to be in the, in the um, document. Um, I've already talked about the scope of, of coverage. Um, again, we have 
a little bit broader. Stalking may include non-sex-based stalking, so it doesn't have to be about a relationship that has ended or a relationship that someone wants to start, but they're behaving in ways that come out to stalking. It could be stranger-based stalking, relatively rare. I do a lot of work in this area, but it can happen. We're covering all of that in the policy as revised, so no narrowing uh, of any of that. So one of the reasons that we want to do the split definitions, there's the obscure reason that's too boring to get into. The more practical one is what we're doing is saying where we absolutely have to follow all of the Title IX regulations for process, we are doing that. Um, those involve some, some increased notice requirements, which are not particularly onerous. Those are fine. There is mandated in the new regulations an opportunity for a unabashedly, according to the department, unabashedly adversarial cross-examination uh, process. Um, now, we will be appointing hearing officers who are going to be managing those processes. And well, adversarial is used as a description because that's what the legal system would do. People are not going to be allowed to behave poorly. We're gonna to have to quorum uh, expectations. Uh, people will not be waving fingers at each other and yelling. Um, parties will never be addressing each other personally. Any cross-examination questions have to be done by advisors uh, who are uh, brought in by the parties themselves or appointed by the institution if they don't have one. Those advisors pose the cross-examination questions so that parties never have to hear the other person asking them questions about the, the conduct at issue. Um, right to access evidence. Um, there's a little more right to access it early on in the process mandated by Title IX. It's not on the slide, but there's also some evidence rules that are problematic, frankly. Um, they have very strict requirements in the regs about if a person doesn't appear for the hearing and submit to cross-examination, you can't rely on anything that they've said. Uh, and that can be quite narrowed down to even one or one question that was relevant that was posed. And they, if they absolutely refuse to, act, to answer it, you could be in a situation where their other testimony gets excluded. That can have real practical effects when you have a big investigation report that they've contributed to or statements or text messages they've sent that could be relevant. So we want to minimize the effect of those things um, to the extent that we can. So we basically have two tracks. We have a procedural uh, system for Title IX cases that follows all the rules, including some of those, uh, those that are a little more difficult to follow, but will be followed explicitly and in good faith, um, but then where we can uh, soften some of those less um, easy to work with rules, but still provide a very fair, robust process, we're going to do that for the non-Title IX sexual misconduct. So that's, that's the approach that was taken. And, and I have clients doing different things. Clients around the country are doing a range of things. Uh, I would say that what VSC is doing is, is quite representative of what I'm seeing. Um, but, it's, but there are different ways to do it. Um, the retaliation definition is here. You'll have the PowerPoint for your reference. But one issue is there is a change in the duty to cooperate. We used to say uh, community members have a duty to cooperate with our investigations. Now there's language in the retaliation provision that says you have a duty to refuse to participate. So therefore, it's, it's unlikely we're going to take disciplinary action against someone who says, I don't want to be a witness. I don't want to talk to you. They have a right to say that. We certainly will try and encourage them because we really very much want to hear what people have to say if it's relevant, but we are probably less likely to be saying you have to, you have to participate because we don't want to run afoul of the retaliation issues. There are confidentiality requirements, which certainly will be um, respected. Um, supportive measures is something that is very much touted by the department as being part of their whole system. They view it as when a, when a report is made, they come to a Title IX coordinator on one of your campuses and they say, I, something happened to me, I'm not sure what I want to do about it. And rather than diving immediately into an investigation, the Title IX coordinator instead says, the first thing I want to emphasize to you is that we have a lot of ways that we can support you. We can change your class schedule, we can change where you live, we can provide a campus safety escort, um, we can do any number of things uh, that help you. And sometimes that can even include changing the other parties' um, uh, classes and all of that, if it can be done without unreasonably burdening them, short of an investigation and a finding of responsibility. But there's this balance around you can't be unreasonably burdening people, 
unless you followed a whole procedure. So the idea of interim suspensions and so on has really fallen aside under the new regime. But the hope is that we provide support first, then we respect the complainant's wishes as to whether they want to go forward with a formal complaint. Um, sometimes the school has to go forward even if they don't want us to um, because we really perceive a, a significant safety issue for them or the rest of the campus. So that's something that has to be weighed out. Um, but the, the perspective of the new regulations is that that should be relatively rare or more rare than might have been encouraged under prior guidance from the department. All right. So this is uh, what this slide is portraying is different outlines of things and the things that will be in the uh, policy 311 procedures that the chancellor will be um, uh, uh, issuing, but those have been drafted to this point. Um, yeah, this is the really boring part we won't get into. If it's not a Title IX matter, you have to technically dismiss it from the Title IX process, but then we can immediately transfer it over to the non-Title IX process, which is very parallel, which is which, so that it's not really a, a, a effective uh, dismissal. Uh, we move forward quickly. Um, advisors can be at meetings. That's not new for us. We have investigation reports that the parties can look to, and then we have the hearing officer piece and, and a distinction between the Title IX hearings and the quote unquote non-Title IX hearings, which are gonna address similar issues is in the non-Title IX hearings, we don't have the advisors posing questions and the advisors can be attorneys. We don't have potentially attorneys posing questions to the parties, cross-examination questions. Uh, we have the chair doing it. And the chair can ask questions that the chair thinks are good and fair and appropriate to, um, to seek clarification from parties. <laughs> And they, they can also use questions that the parties submit to them. And to the extent that they're relevant and appropriate, no doubt the chairs will pose those questions. The idea is there's probably uh, just as much effectiveness in doing this without so much of the anxiety of the idea of an adversarial situation. Um, just so you have a sense of it being trustees of a public institution, the rule that said you gotta have live cross-examination in an adversarial way was really rolled out by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Two judges in that circuit in Ohio ruled that that was the way they shot it, thought things should happen at a public institution involving a sexual assault allegations that involve credibility determinations. The First Circuit in Boston, much uh, more recently in August of 2019, Sixth Circuit was in September of 2018, held that this sort of model where a chair follows what's called an inquisitorial role and asks the questions and has to ask good questions and seek to interview for clarification, that that is a perfectly permissible model under the constitution. Um, so that would be fine under the first circuit, obviously you're in the second circuit in Vermont, but I think it would be persuasive um, because other courts um, have not gone the sixth circuit route, yet the Department of Education went the sixth circuit route and has applied something to all schools across the country, public and private, that is more stringent than uh, what uh, courts have said, uh, in some cases at least, is required even for publics like the VSC. In any event, our processes are all gonna be fair and robust across the board. There are just some details that the Title IX process must include that frankly was determined that we're not gonna be all that helpful to resolving matters and getting to um, the truth by a preponderance so those were shaved off uh, in order to facilitate the resolution of non-Title IX cases that still involve these really delicate issues to the extent that we can. Sanctioning is going to be done by deans of students, president or chancellor with employees. We're going to follow collective bargaining agreements there. Um, both parties can appeal. One significant difference is, and you may, you may hear requests for this or, or information about how things are going, since 97-2001, Definitely 2001, there was a document from the Department of Ed that said, you cannot mediate sexual assault cases, sexual violence cases. It was reiterated in 2011, feeling that the power dynamics were, were not appropriate for that kind of resolution. Some schools did alternative justice because that's not literally mediation, it's different in the meantime, but a lot of schools shied away and said, no, we, we're, we're afraid of the department on this one. This Department of Ed is saying it is a fair option if both parties wanna participate in it and the Title IX coordinator thinks it's appropriate. So we have in our policies in 311 um, uh, said that informal resolution is appropriate if the parties want to engage in it. 
So you'll probably hear more about that as things develop and different models um, uh, develop and approach that. Okay. So just so, just so everybody knows, someone is not muted, so we're hearing your conversation um, uh, on the line. But I'll I'll continue to talk. It doesn't matter to me. Um, a bit of a policy update to policy 311, clarifying that the allegations of sexual harassment that meet the definition of prohibited conduct must follow 311A procedures. Conduct that does not meet prohibited conduct, broadly defined there, do not. And with that, I will stop uh, rambling and um, ask if you have questions for me. I'm happy to answer them. Does anyone have any questions? If not, uh, uh, I'd like to ask the chancellor. Um, this must be approved by August 14th, which is two days away. Um, I can't remember. I don't think there was a resolution that was introduced in our packet. Is this, well, this is an action item, is it not? Action item, yes. And I, I just want to flag that Ryan had his hand up. I, you, I know you probably didn't see because it was down the sign, uh, down the side. So I, I just I'll defer to Ryan for a moment. Sure. Thank Go you. Ahead, Ryan. Yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to clarify on the cross examination part. So as I understand that, of course, the parties will submit their questions, and the third party in this case would then ask the questions. During these cross-examination hearings, would the two parties be in the same room when these questions are being asked? That's a terrific question. So even before COVID, even before we conducted our professional lives on Zoom, this issue was anticipated, not, not the COVID issue, obviously, but the idea that um, these issues were going to be hard enough uh, to not have people have to sit in the same room with each other. By practice in higher ed, we've been doing this for some years. But even in the proposed rulemaking floated in November of 18, it was said, if schools want to facilitate virtual attendance, everyone does have to be able to simultaneously hear and see each other in a Title IX covered case that involves this live testimony, but they don't have to be in the same room. So even if everyone's on campus back in the olden days when we did that, um, or when we were together, um, that's okay. They can still be in separate rooms and Zoom or other technology can enable them to be participating that way. Or if people are on different sides of the country, that's okay as well. Obviously, we know from the technology we're on that we have the ability to simultaneously hear and see each other. And, and the way it will work is it, it was, and that was something anticipated in this decision from the Sixth Circuit as well. And, um, and, and some schools, I mean, I work with schools in the Sixth Circuit, one in particular, um, and they've been having these hearings for some time. The way that it works uh, there and the way that it will work under the department's rules is uh, only relevant questions are to be, are to be answered, put it that way. So if a person is the advisor and they're asking the questions, they pose the question, they look to the chair, the chair says, go ahead or no, you don't have to answer that, depending on whether they think the question is relevant. Now, that is intended to build a pause into it so you don't have this rapid fire, it's like you'd see on television, hammering away cross-examination. That's the hope. But you still are going to have folks whose profession it is to do just that, and they're going to do whatever they can to move things in that direction and get into a rhythm and, and do cross-examination the way they would like to. In a courtroom, it's going to be a bit of a struggle back and forth um, to maintain some semblance of an educational setting and environment while complying with these rules. And you're going to have to have a strong chairs who are able to enforce the quorum rules. But I will say relevance is a very broad standard. So anything that makes a fact and issue more or less likely because the evidence has been considered is relevant. So there's going to be a lot that's going to be brought in. You can't repeat. You can't badger for no reason. But it, these, these hearings are going to be long and they're going to be difficult for both parties and people are just going to have to work hard and your chairs are going to have to work hard to to try and draw out what's fair i i am gratified the department um recognized that we can approach these things one thing i do a lot of is trauma-informed interviewing and um investigations and some had criticized that and said well that's that's too favorable toward complainants it's unfair to respondents that was included in comments to the regulations. 
And fortunately, the department cited a paper that I did to the contrary that said trauma-informed can be fair. It can be done in a way that's fair to all parties. We interview for clarification, et cetera. And the department cited that eight times in the preamble, so we know we're on solid ground. And I know Vermont State Colleges would subscribe to those kinds of approaches. We're on solid ground using it because the department has specifically cited to the work that I did to say, this can be done right, be careful, be fair to everybody. But you know, the point about, are they gonna be in the same room? No, they don't have to be. And you can take advantage of that, but there's still gonna be some challenges and we're gonna have to work through them, but um, we'll do our very best in good faith. So if I may, to follow up on that, based on what you've just explained to me, you don't believe, and policy and people who have written this and researched this, don't believe that forcing these hearings to happen, having people maybe not in the same room, but still seeing and hearing each other and having these questions asked, you don't believe that would decrease the amount of people coming forward, that people would feel challenged by these? My concern is with these hearings now, people aren't going to step up and say something. That's my concern here. I feel we're putting people in that corner, but you're, from what you're telling me, they don't believe that would be the case. So this is not at all about what I believe. <laughs> I'm telling you what the department is saying, right? From the beginning, um, and I'm, I'm on record in the Chronicle of Higher Education saying from the beginning, and, and victims advocates, survivors advocates can say it a lot more convincingly than me, this is gonna chill reporting. I have no doubt that this is gonna make it less likely that someone, when they hear about the process, is gonna to wanna to, uh, go through the entire process. And again, if they don't, they can, they can give statements to um, public safety, they can give statements to Title IX, they can go with an investigator, but if they don't appear at the hearing and submit to cross-examination and answer all the relevant questions, we can't consider anything else they've said. Is that gonna chill reporting? You bet it is. So we're gonna to have to do what we can to keep our processes as respectful and appropriate as possible. Um, the department's view is that is a risk and we think the due process side of it for respondents is worth that risk. There is a massive political divide as to how that particular view is, um, is viewed, hence the 125,000 comments, not all of which were on that point, but a lot of them are on that point. Um, so now that we are, we are in this world where this is the system we have, we're gonna do our very best to separate people physically, require decorum, use trauma-informed practices as permitted by the department to build our investigation file. Um, there are ways to um, address things with hearing officers. I do training for hearing officers around the country on this, where they can ask questions in a way that is appropriate and trauma-informed, but also gets to the clarifying matters the way we need to in a way that's fair to everybody. But it's not easy. It's a challenge for sure. When you were formerly had models where um, uh, people, and, and, and I think VSC, I know UVM, had models where investigators did the investigation and there was no hearing. Um, that is obviously a lot less difficult for either party. And frankly, I think those systems can work very well where you have good quality investigators like you do. The department doesn't agree because they got some horror stories in the summer of 2017 when doing listening, se listening sessions that some respondents had bad experiences and they very much took that to heart and that was validated by this court decision in 2018. But it's, it's gonna be a challenge, but we're, you know, we're up for it to do the best we can for folks. And then what the department would say, and what I know is what we'll try our very best, is they'd say, look, if someone does not want to engage in a hearing, then we're gonna provide supportive measures and we're gonna do everything we can for them, whether they participate in a hearing or not. Um, that's okay, that's fine, but to me, where you have a situation where something has happened that should be addressed, that may not be addressing campus safety issues in the way that you want either. So it's, it's a challenge, no doubt about it. Brian, I would just add that we, we did, the VSC did submit comments to the department addressing your specific issue about our concerns around having live hearings and cross-examination having a chilling impact. So um, again, we weren't alone. That was a big, huge issue. A lot of people submitted comments, but this is where uh, the department has come down, and I, I, Jeff, I would assume if there's a change in the administration in November, it, there could well be a shift back um, in the other direction. Absolutely. I, I was on an American, and I got you, Linda. I was on American Council on Education uh, task force that submitted ACE's comments to this, 
So ACE represents thousands and thousands of institutions through all of their associations across the country. And we couldn't have been more strong about this exact topic that you just shouldn't be turning an educational system into a courtroom and all of the ill effects it was gonna have. The department went the way that it went. Um, I, I, you know, I have a, a slide I'll be, I presented it yesterday. I'll probably be talking about it this afternoon in another webinar that puts all these different media clippings of various things. And one of them I can picture down in the right-hand corner is uh, Vice President Biden saying, essentially, if I am elected, these are going away. Um, so, I, you know, that is something that, if they are rules, they are regulations. It's not as easy as withdrawing guidance, but I am quite confident that if the Department of Education under a new administration decided, we are not gonna enforce these as written and we're gonna tell people we're not enforcing them, that schools are not gonna enforce them unless they want to. And I tell you, being on the ACE and working with schools around, around the country, schools are not happy. They are going to comply in good faith. I have no doubt about that. And schools absolutely care about respondents' rights as they did before, uh, despite arguments to the contrary, yet, there are parts of this that are just unnecessarily uh, legalistic. So I think that aspect of it will fall aside and public institutions like BSC can do a lot to be fully cognizant of respondent rights without doing all of the things that these rules rather um, awkwardly attempt to do. Linda had a question. Yeah, Linda, be, uh, just a second. I'm just gonna tell everybody an easy way to go and raise your hand and be recognized is at the bottom of your screen there's a little thing called participants, and it shows on the right side the list of all the people here. And down there, there's a little thing where you raise your hand, and then you can lower your hand. I'm going to ask Jen to monitor that if she can. Is that something you can do, Jen? Corey? Yes, I can do that now. Did you want to open it up to public comment right now, or just trustee? Well, well let's just do trustees to begin with. Um, Linda is next, but if you want to raise your hand, that's an effective way to do it without having, you can't see everybody on these screens anyway. So Linda, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Jeff. How are we as um, trustees gonna be able to have a sense or sort of monitor or have, have a sense of how this is impacting reporting how um, how complaints are handled um, on the VSC. I come at it, I ha it's, it's tough for me to get it. And I come at it from um, 70s, my four years of college, I had not only a good friend who was a victim, so these procedures were important, but I had, let's say, good acquaintances. They were roommates, who, women who proven, and they then admitted they just falsely accused people. <laughs> um, and it went to hearings and such. And, and since they admitted to many of us that they were falsely accusing people. There were several of us who testified against them. So, you know, I, I sort of, I get a sense of, I have this experience that makes me really in tune to both sides of it. So what I want to know as a trustee is how do we as a trustee best understand the impact it has on our campuses and um, how do we make sure that 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 the campuses are handling it well and fairly yeah so i would say that you know the data will be there to be able to compare your internal clery act numbers versus how many cases are going through um adjudication full hearing adjudication so you may have a certain now people that go to your counseling center their numbers are not going to show up in your query sexual assault numbers. And frankly, your sexual assault numbers are so low anyway um, that it may not be a, a statistically relevant or even uh, anecdotally relevant thing. But um, you may see a drop in reporting. You may get it anecdotally from um, counseling center folks who say, look, I can't get into the details, but I am hearing more hesitancy on the part of people who come to us. I would say, you know, you can, you can learn, you can ask Sophie about that and 
and, and she can pull folks for you. I don't know if the VSC does sort of an, of an update on how those things are going on campuses. Some schools do, a lot of schools don't. It's not something you have to do, but that may be one way to do it. As far as the fairness side of it, I mean, there's, there's so much robust process built into this now uh, and a full opportunity for cross-examination in Title IX sexual harassment cases and even in non-Title IX cases, there's gonna be a full hearing, which is much more robust than a process that didn't involve one. So this the system has moved toward uh, procedural um, requirements well in excess of what I think the constitution requires. So on that on that sense, the fairness side of it, I think, I think I'm pretty confident that you're good there. I think Linda, in the past we had uh, reports, each college is reported in the summer um, gathered for the, the previous academic year and reported to the EPSL committee on the number of reports and investigations. And we just, we haven't done it this year. Our, in fact, our system investigator was laid off in, <laughs> in April. Um, so we will be looking to fill that position right now. We have a, a, a comparable position being posted. So, um, but yeah, we, we have been reporting to the EPSL committee the trends over the past few years. Trustee Jack. Thank you, Lynn, um, and thank you, Jeffrey. I, I do have a, a question, or maybe it's more of a confirmation, but just some commentary also. I, I do have to agree with Ryan's concerns, and I just sort of generally, you know, express disappointment in the Federal uh, Department of, of um, Education at a time when there is a national reckoning with, um, you know, individuals' behaviors at all levels, including in higher education and among students, uh, that the Department of Education would go in a direction that is contrary to that, that sort of makes it more difficult for survivors and for victims to report, or at least makes it less likely they will because of fear of the process that they'll have to engage in. It, it just seems out of step. And, and I think most people would probably concur with that. My question is that sort of what I asked a couple of months ago is, you know, there's no possibility here that we can ignore this requirement. It's something that is tied to our federal funding, as I understand it, um, and just wanted to make sure I could I could get that um, confirmed. Uh, but otherwise, hopefully, you know, the VSC can provide all the support that we can um, to, to any to survivors, you know, while this rule is in place, hopefully it's not in place for very long. Um, and I do also want to just compliment um, you, Jeffrey, and your presentation and what you provided to us in terms of um, policies, because it seems like you did your best to lean in favor of survivors' rights in drafting these. So um, I appreciate that as well. Thank you, Michael. I really do appreciate that. Uh, I, um, in terms of confirming whether you have to comply with these or not, if you would like your students to receive financial aid, right. then you pretty much have to comply with these. Presuming that that's relatively important to your existence uh, as an institution, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the department wouldn't be fooling around on this. You know, there's 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 some laws, FERPA, for example. You might have heard the education privacy. There's no enforcement teeth to FERPA, and the people that in, that that look at that law are you know they're very good to work with. They, they educate. You know, if someone were to say, "Look, we're not following this," the department would quickly move to enforce, and they would get you know, the U.S. Attorney's Office involved in the whole night. So there's really no option there. Um, you know, I, basically, I think that the philosophy of the system has been we absolutely are going to comply in a way that's fair to all of our students and employees, all of whom are community members. Um, there are ways to uh, navigate these sensitive, difficult situations that are, um, as I said, trauma-informed and fair to everyone. And that's something that's been a stock and trade for me that fortunately was picked up by the department's preamble. And it's something that I think philosophically that the BSC would agree with, that there are opportunities within a very legalist system to be empathic, to be decent to both parties. We do not have to behave in a way that involves yelling and finger pointing and acting like we're in a TV courtroom drama. Um, and we're gonna be able to maintain that. Um, and that's, that's something that's really important. It's gonna be more difficult. I think the department's view would probably be it should be difficult because the consequences of being found responsible for sexual assault are life changing, which is true. Um, so there you have it. Um, I think we're going to do our very best to work within it. I'm hopeful that 
where things need to be addressed through a disciplinary process that people are willing to do it with the support of uh, neutral folks who really are there to focus not on, you know, do we favor complainants or do we favor respondents or do we favor women or men or people of any gender identity? Instead, we focus on proven misconduct. And if that has been demonstrated through a fair process, we take action. Before that point, we're neutral and fair to all community members. And I think that's, that's the most that we can do ethically for everybody. Are there any other questions? I don't see any, Chair Dickinson. Okay. Um, well, we don't have a resolution to read that would move us along, but it sounds like we have no choice but to um, make a motion to accept or this, this, uh, this change in our policies. If there's someone who would like, go ahead, Jim. You're muted. So move, Lynn, thank you. Hey, Lynn, we need to move to uh, approve the revisions both to policy 311A and policy 311. Yes, we are both 311 and 311A. Would you like to adjust your um, motion to accept the revisions in both of those? Surely would. Okay, anyone want to do a second? Second. Okay, that was? David. David, good, thank you. Any further discussion? Well, yes, yes. Yeah, I appreciate the work that's been done on this. I understand the frustrations that um, many people have expressed or several people have expressed. I guess the, um, the point is we just have to work through it as best we can and it'll be incumbent on the on the um, people who facilitate these meetings or handle, you know, people on staff um, to use the procedures that we've been dealt as effectively as possible, protecting both sides when possible also. So we, we get a, an accurate result. So I appreciate all the work that um, goes forward from this point. This is a new starting point to a certain extent. Anyone else have anything to add? No, seeing no more comments, um, I'd like to move the motion and those in favor of the revisions to policy 311 and 311A, please indicate by saying aye. All right. All right. Aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, it sounds like the policies have been revised. Thank you very much uh, to Jeffrey Nolan for his input and his work on this. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Um, complicated issues, and it sounds as if we're actually going above and beyond. So that is good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, one of the things that I was hoping, because we do have people who have to leave early, is that we would be able to hear from our special guest, who is um, item number six. Uh, we have the report of the Long Range Planning Commission and a presentation by James Page, who is our consultant and who has worked with the legislative leaders and the treasurer to put out a pretty comprehensive report. And so we're going to switch number five and number six. We're going to do six first. So um, I don't know what we want to do with um, it's. it's it's up to Michael Pichak, who is the chair of the Long Range Planning Commission, but uh, do you want to introduce uh, James Page or shall we just have Mr. Page start off? He's here from Maine and we really welcome him and appreciate his input. I think, Lynn, I think he's a man who needs no introduction now in Vermont uh, higher ed scene. Okay, in that case, uh, James Page, um, you're, you have the floor. Good, can you hear me all right? Am I coming through? Yep. All right. Well, thank you folks for the opportunity to, uh, to address you today. Uh, I want to, first of all, I don't know if, uh, if Church is still on the, on the line or not, but he was the person that I worked with from the board in preparing my report. Uh, and I could not have had a better, uh, you could not have had a better advocate. I could not have had a better source of insight and information than what church provided during that time. So if you're still on church, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I certainly join all of you in extending uh, thanks to him for all the work that he's done here. Uh, I also would like to just take a brief moment and say uh, how impressed I've been uh, in the last couple of months with the, the speed with which you folks, uh, with which with the chancellors that me, 
uh, has been have been really centering on these issues and that she's been building her team, uh, getting things in order. It's very considering that the academy often has a, a reputation, sometimes justified of moving a bit slow. Uh, this is this is very encouraging and I hope you're encouraged by what you're seeing with your team and how this is being put together. Uh, I did do the report uh, that was uh, under the auspices of the Joint uh, Fiscal Office and submitted that in parallel with the, uh, the Treasurer's report uh, back in early June. Uh, since then, in full disclosure, I, I think you all know, uh, but I have uh, entered into a, a, a very part-time consulting relationship with you folks working directly with the Chancellor. So what in, in talking with the Chancellor, what we thought would be uh, uh, useful would be to repeat, for me to repeat, uh, basically the outline of the legislative briefings I gave, and I gave three of them to leadership, uh, uh, different groups, almost the same presentation each time, depending on where the Q&A went, uh, but with a slightly different emphasis. The three points that I uh, focused on was first the challenges and in particular demographics. Uh, I'm gonna repeat that uh, pretty much here. Uh, the second was uh, the role and issues around the Legislative Select Committee. And while I've mentioned those, I don't intend to spend a lot of time on that here. And then third was uh, issues around uh, VSC. And in the legislative readings, I did not spend much time in those issues, but I reversed that and spent a little bit more time here. And then uh, open it up to what you folks would like to do in terms of Q&A or general discussion. I should also say that even though I'm falling under the agenda item of the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, that I was have not been part of that process. Um, and so the recommendations that are just coming forward on that and the work that they've been doing, again, with uh, my uh, appreciation for how fast they're moving and with the seriousness of it, I have not had input into that. They have not worked with me on the other things. So we're a bit running in parallel here. So with that, I'll start. Uh, in terms of the first item, uh, I want to, I certainly don't want to diminish the seriousness of the COVID uh, pandemic. It is an extraordinarily serious issue uh, for everybody and especially for our higher ed institutions or for education in general. Someday, however, that problem is going to be resolved. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be two months from now or two years from now, but someday, someday it is. When that's done, you're still gonna be facing this basic demographic and related challenges that you had before. So in terms of long-term challenges, while COVID is, is right in everybody's face and we have to deal with it successfully, um, we can't be uh, considered to be, let that mask, if you will, uh, the longer term structural issues specifically around demographics that Vermont and indeed all of the Northeast faces. Uh, the pool of prospective students is shrinking, and that's just a fact, and it's, it's not going to change, uh, shy of major, major changes in migratory patterns and economic development strategies by the state. That's not going to change in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, so a situation which was always serious is going to become more serious. And if you look at my report, there's a very uh, uh, important graph put together by the Joint Fiscal Office that says that, or shows how that works. I would also recommend to you, I'm not getting any percentage of this, but there's a, there's a book and I'll leave Jen the, the title and they're called Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education by a very, very fine statistical demographer named Nathan Graw. This is the best study and it goes down to state level of, of demographic trends in public higher education for the next 15 years that I'm aware of anywhere. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively quick read, skipping over the highly technical parts of the, of the ma mathematics, but the story that it's telling for the country as a whole and the Northeast in particular is confirms in a very factual basis uh, what I'm sure you folks all know, which the demographic challenge for New England is severe. That doesn't mean that everybody should simply throw their hands up, far from it. Uh, the responses that uh, there are a set of responses that people need to uh, figure out how to do and which should achieve priorities, which are more most relevant to Vermont and pursue. But of course, uh, in, in those, just to name a couple of the more obvious ones, is to increase the core student profile. Are you serving all Vermonters as well as you're serving the 18 to 24 year olds? Uh, the answer to that may be in certain instances, yes but in other instances, there may be room for improvement. 
Are there opportunities for increasing the percentage of students uh, who are coming out of high school uh, or who are near young adults, if you will, who are attending some form of post-secondary education? And then if they are uh, improving retention. Retention is a, <coughs> excuse me, an issue that is uh, alive throughout the country. And uh, those, those institutions who are doing the work and uh, carrying out the work to improve their retention are showing the, the largest benefits of, of, against these various challenges that we're seeing. So uh, there, is, there is many things that can be done. And so this, the demographic issue should not be a, a sign of despair. It's just a very serious issue that the numbers have to be, have to be dealt with. Um, the second item, so I'm going to pass on from that. I, I hope that's fairly uh, straightforward. The second item I talked about with uh, the, the legislators was the Legislative Select Committee. And there I encouraged them to focus on three tasks um, that I felt was certainly within the intent of what they were trying to get at. Uh, one was to set priorities uh, rather than certainly, well, let me jump to the end for a moment. I'm a great believer in the, in the old adage that structure follows strategy. So get your strategies in order first before you do your structure. Um, in order to do your strategies, you need to know where you want to go. To, so set your priorities at the, at, and for a legislative group, uh, that should very much be, uh, in my mind, for a public higher education system, external priorities. What do you want for the citizens, for the students, for the businesses and communities of Vermont that VSC can best uh, provide? Not so that, that you would articulate those priorities in terms of external measures. And secondly, make them measurable, make them measurable. Everybody agrees on the value of quality higher education. Simply reinforcing that uh, won't meet the legislative intent. But secondly, once you've set some priorities, address the questions of resources. Uh, the Vermont State College system is not a rich system. It is, uh, it is lean. Uh, there's always areas for improvement, et cetera. But uh, you, don't have the, you don't have the size. You don't have the critical mass that would allow you to you know, the, use the term cut your way to success. And that's almost never a strategy anyway. Do there have to be changes? Yes but simply expecting the, those changes to come by a cutting of the expense side rather than a growth of the revenue side or better, a more efficient use of the resources you have is the, is the way you need to go. But the Legislative Select Committee needs to address the question of resources and ultimately it can't, <coughs> um, it's, there's limited resources and we live in a resource constrained environment. That's going to mean setting priorities in uh, that are in some, in some respects bring in a scope of issues that go beyond that of public higher education. Those are the, those are the choices that the legislature needs to make. The third thing they can do in addition to set priorities and address resources to, is to rally public support. Um, you folks have gone through an, an awful lot of difficult times and those have uh, almost of necessity raised questions in the public mind about the value of the, of the educational experience. The educational experience in the Vermont state system is real. It is incredibly valuable. It is of great value to the students and the people of Vermont, but that message is muddled uh, at the moment. So everything that the, uh, that the legislature can do to help rally that support uh, would be critical as well. So set priorities, address resources, rally public support. The other item, which was more sort of logistical, and I believe uh, the information I'm getting is that they are making an adjustment, is that time here, while you can't uh, usefully or productively rush these things, you also don't, it's time is not your friend. And the original legislative calendar, which had the final delivery of the, of the select committee's report due a year from this December, uh, runs you into a further year, uh, a second and even third year of, of design and implementation, the need for bridge funding, et cetera, all the while your background conditions continue to, to chug along and worsen in most cases. So that uh, I believe they've adopted a more aggressive timetable on this. I haven't seen the final decisions and report on this um, and I, I, I'll see it, I'll read it in the paper probably when you do, but uh, I've encouraged them to think of a timeline by which their report would come up by next spring, the final version of it next spring. Uh, which would, working backwards, 
would also require some interim reports to get public feedback, to get all the processes that you need to do to, to test those ideas uh, in a fairly aggressive timeline, considering it's now already almost the middle of August. Uh, those were basically, we, we talked a little bit more in some detail about some of those issues and we can come back, but that was the, my, my um, leading uh, set of recommendations for the legislative committee. Work priorities, address resources, rally public support, watch the time and, and uh, the way in which that report obviously feeds in and informs and is informed by the work that you folks are doing and others as well. The third issue that I focused on in terms of the VSC, uh, I spoke briefly to these issues and here I'm going to expand it for the, for the purposes of this group. Uh, to repeat what I just said, uh, what I found in looking at the Vermont State College system was the incredible value that your folks provide in terms of programs and services to your students, to the businesses in Vermont, and to the communities in Vermont. Um, this is, it is, a, it is an irreplaceable gem. Uh, that, is should, that is not, however, to be read as a defense of the status quo. It is that the things that are really working uh, and that are critical to your mission need to be nurtured and supported and even grown. But there's a lot of other things that are probably gonna need to be changed in order to be able to do that. Uh, your mission, as you know, your mandated mission is statewide. Uh, it is for all of Vermont. I love the fact that your mission starts with those three words, for all of Vermont. And the only group uh, that can carry out that mission, that has the resources and that has the mandate to do that, is you. Uh, the individual campuses are the, are the delivery mechanisms, they're the, they're the pieces that work together to form this great organization, but it's a the system as a whole, which is going to have to be responsible for and deliver to this mission. And to do that, you have been historically set up, even though you have the statutory um, uh, authority to act as a uh, to act as a system and to act as a board uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a more aligned and aggressive manner, if you will, at the risk of being a little provocative than, you, than the board sometimes has in the past. That it's the, I found the system to be operating as a federation, more as a system, and my strong encouragement is to, to, to do the work as a system. Uh, that mean, that is not easy because it's not simply a structural change in how you do certain things. It's also a cultural change. And, and it, though many of you have been involved in, in, in businesses or in other organizations of this kind of complexity, and you know that cultural change is the hardest kind of change to, to implement successfully. So this is not to say that this is an easy task. Um, if I look at, uh, if, if I was making a set of recommendations for this next steps, uh, they mirror fairly closely the recommendations that I made to the Legislative Select Committee uh, with some expansion. And those, first of all, uh, that the board, I would encourage the board to set priorities, system level priorities um, that are heavily external because you're serving after all your students, businesses and communities that are measurable uh, everybody, the, the materials that I've been reading, the headings under the categories, I think are exactly right. You and your teams have emphasized accessibility, affordability, quality of programs, and relevance of those programs, especially with respect to work and workforce opportunities. I think those are exactly right, but that's only the first step. What does each of those four categories mean uh, in terms of outcomes? How do you measure whether or not you've been success, successful in those? I don't, I'm not sitting here and I wouldn't claim to be sitting here with an answer to those questions because they're gonna differ depending upon the context. And Maine is certainly different from Vermont, which is different from Massachusetts, which is different from Illinois. Uh, but the headings are right. What are the right measures? What are the right key performance indicators that you or as a board want to draw everybody's attention and focus to and ensure that uh, the institution is meeting those. Once you have those priorities, uh, then, then it's up to a lot of parties and you'll figure out the organization of that together with the chancellor and her staff 
and the presidents on how to develop and assess strategies for meeting those priorities. And those should be, uh, and again, the strategies need to be tied to the priorities, as I just said. Then the next step of that analysis is to address the resources, because it's only in the context of the resources that you have that you can do the multi-year planning, the resource allocation, and uh, construct the audit structures you'll need to ensure that the measures, the KPIs, the priorities are being met. And only then do you really get to the point where, it discuss in my mind and in my experience, that a discussion about structure comes wholly into focus and is really productive. Now, it's an iterative process. It's not purely linear. Um, obviously, there will be input about one, one of those topics out of order from another, and you'll, in the process of thinking this, go through, iterate the whole thing several times. That's okay. My main point, however, is that a discussion about structure is premature if you don't know what you're trying to ultimately achieve. And uh, again, structure follows strategies. I think that's, I hope that that's pretty straightforward. Uh, so I'll end up here one more thing. In my, in my report, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to look at it, but my very last paragraph, or a couple of paragraphs, I suggested that this really should be the year of the board. And one of the reasons I'm really pleased to be able to uh, talk with you all today is to, uh, to really uh, emphasize that point, that all of the things that need to be done, uh, that in whatever order, in whatever the details are, uh, are really only going to happen if there is an, uh, you know, aligned uh, agreement amongst the board and around those priorities, it doesn't mean that every detail everybody's going to sign off on, and it's not going to be a, a lowest common denominator consensus. But it's it means that when when the presidents, when the chancellor, uh, are called upon to make uh, to explain why they're moving in certain directions, to uh, to allocate resources in one direction or another, they can point to the their work with the board and say this is what the people of Vermont acting through the board uh, have, uh, under, understand that we, we need to do for them. Um, and then to, um, to, to carry out, I mean, not your, it's a, it's a, obviously it's a volunteer organization, so time is limited, but to work with leadership, uh, either the chancellor's office and the president's, to, to ensure that those priorities are what you need and what you want, to ensure that the strategies make sense, to ensure that the resources are there to do it, and to ensure and, and, and do the proper amount of auditing along the way, because no plan survives, as the old saying, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, these are gonna be living documents that you're gonna be reworking and revisiting on a regular basis. Um, the board has enormous statutory authority as the sole fiscal authority uh, for, for the institution. Um, I think that, that the chancellor is, is, is recognizing that, is putting together a set of teams and ideas and priorities insofar as she's, she and I have talked it thus far, which are going to get you, in, are really going to move in that direction. I would be encouraged, I hope, and I hope you all are encouraged by the directions and the steps you've taken in the last couple of months and where your leadership is taking you. Uh, but that is to say, there's a lot of hard work, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, to come in the next few weeks and months. So I'll stop there and I'd be happy to take uh, questions about what I've said or what I've not said, anything in the report uh, or contribute to any discussion you'd like to have. Any questions? We'll start with the board. Trustee Kluver. Thank you. And, and uh, Jim, thank you for that report. You talked a lot about demographics. In our last meeting, um, someone had brought up the point that we can't just focus on demographics and had suggested that what the system really has is a cost problem. Mm -hmm. Can you address that? Do we have both a cost and a demographics problem? Can we decouple those? Or truly, if we focused on cost, could we overcome the demographic problem? You, it's a, it's a, the, the, your interlocutor raised a very legitimate question and point, so thank you. Uh, the demographics is just a fact of life, and there's going to be, uh, to overuse, and I apologize for the sports metaphor, if you think of going out and recruiting, you're going to have a lot fewer shots on goal. So statistically, 
you've you've got you've got that you've got that question of a shrinking number of potential students. Costs the cost problems are very uh, legitimate and very real. Affordability and for if for no other reason then you, they drive the affordability question. They're one of the two major issues that drive affordability for students. Cost, uh, you know, there's the old line, I think I referred to it earlier, that you can't cut your way to success, and especially when, when you're already lean to begin with. Uh, you can restructure, you can, re, uh, you can move cost areas around, you can reduce areas in one, but you've certainly got a lot of other areas you could usefully invest in. Cost, short-term cost structures, which you need to do sometimes to just because you have to balance a budget and there's no other choices there, can be a short term effectively, but what you're really looking for it, once you get past the short term emergency, in my experience, is the ability to restructure your resource allocation, your cost structures, so that you're, you're meaningfully and materially bending your trend lines of cost increases over a period of time. And that's, that requires real changes in, uh, in, in how you do things. But if you can do that, because if you do a, a five year uh, pick a number, a five-year, multi-year analysis of, of where your, uh, your, um, uh, your budget is likely to be with respect to a certain number of parameters, both cost and exp uh, revenue and expenses, uh, you'll find that uh, if, if Vermont is anything like the rest of the country, and I'm sure it's not that different, uh, that you're getting killed by, uh, you know, 3% year over year here, 6% year over there, there. Mm -hmm. when you're when when tuition can never match that and shouldn't mm -hmm. um, so it, it you you could look at you know use health insurance as one one example and i don't know the the details of your health insurance program but if you do a five year analysis and you can peg your health insurance costs at at, at 4% rather than 7.5% you'll you'll know exactly what that means in terms of long term structural savings so short-term cuts, short-term pieces, yes, if, if they need to be there, uh, and, and quite often they do. We had to do them in Maine, but in the long term, you have to invest in your institutions, and you, if you're continually cutting, you can't invest. And if I may, just to go on for one more moment, um, building off that question, there is a, there is a uh, and I did refer to it in my report, there's a often a misapprehension out there that if somebody gets to zero on a balanced budget, they've done their work. And goodness knows in a day, you know, times like this, getting to zero is hard work and a real feat. But if you haven't got a, a, a margin in there for investment, uh, not just investments in, in, in your heating systems, but investments in your programs, investments in trading your people, you're treading water. You're not even treading water. You're losing ground. So... Long-winded long answer to your question, sorry. Uh, Linda. I'll take the opportunity, Lynn. Uh, Linda was next. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I would, Jim was interested in your, um, both in the reading and in your conversation about the point about the uh, the board has power and it really needs to use it and we need to not we need to change the culture so that we're no longer uh, operating under this five strong colleges model not that we don't want the colleges to be strong but that was really the way we the language we used to say the colleges get to make the decisions. We let them operate independently and we just support them. Um, so I, I really, I'm a little clueless as to how are we culturally gonna make that shift? I'm glad to hear you. I was actually glad to hear you say that um, you're seeing some signs that there are things moving ahead like as a system like that because I've looked at some of this planning and stuff we have and what I keep seeing or feel like I'm seeing is that each college going ahead doing what they wanna do 
And I don't feel like I'm seeing that system strong moving ahead goal. And that worries me. Well, you're in the very early stages. But there's been a number of discussions I've not been part of, but I've been I've been hearing about where people really are starting to to uh, to understand that they'll they'll work stronger, they'll work better and stronger if they work together. And uh, I also know that uh, that uh, the chancellor and her staff are looking at, uh, and you've already taken, I believe, or are about to take a, a major step. In, for example, uh, if you've got a if you've got a an allocation resource allocation program which unwittingly has the unforeseen or unintended consequence that you you've moved your campuses into competition with one another so that i get more resources if i send my if i increase my enrollment even if it's at the cost of your institution uh those sorts of things are what i'm already seeing people getting an awareness of the awareness has to come first oh my goodness yes that kind of competition is 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 damaging to the to the system as a whole, and then starting to work that. This will not be an overnight uh, uh, shift by any means, and you're only uh, in most respects you're only a little ways into it. And you have the early example of of northern example of Northern Vermont University, uh, but and they're two years in, but two years is not a long time uh, to to get the full proof of the pudding to make these kinds of changes. So yes, time is not your friend, but certain things take amount of, a certain amount of time. But uh, the, take for the early steps that you've taken or are, your groups are taking, uh, they're good and they need to be encouraged. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Jim, can you hold up the book again that you'd like us to read? Yes, uh, I'll, get, I'll get to Jim the, uh, the, uh, the, the title is Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education. The author is Nathan Graw, G-R-A-W-E, and it's Johns Hopkins Press. And you can read all about Vermont in it and every other state. Okay, I think Adam is next. Thank you. So uh, given, given the, the short time frame we have to really uh, make a lot of significant changes, your reference to the Federation and the system uh, following up on Linda's and, and previous conversation. Uh, to, to change culture, I think we're gonna have a real challenge in that our culture, we don't have a single brand. Typically a culture is a, a single entity within it. We have already branded ourselves into the different uh, institutions. We, we don't have the Vermont State system. Um, you, you led off with this as one of your first recommendations for the board. In, a, in an allocation of resource for the board's time and bandwidth and, and sort of capacity. Do you think this is the highest recommendation? Is this the thing that we need to focus on first and foremost? Uh, where does that fall given our short period of time? Um, well, let me, let me clarify uh, uh, my point around a couple of your early statements. Uh, I am a big proponent and fan of mission differentiation. So when I say when I say you know build a strong system, it, it doesn't look uh, it doesn't look the same to every you know the, the the what 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 CCV provides and where it develops its strengths and has real strengths is very different from the same point made about Castleton. Sure, they serve a a a they approach and they serve a different core. I think there could be more of an overlap in that but to, that's not the point. So I, I don't, when I say all of this, I certainly don't want to uh, give the impression that I'm favoring a monolithic entity that is the same in Rutland as it is in Brattleboro, as the same as is in Linden, uh, far from it. Uh, what I'm talking about, and I, I'm certainly not advocating building a massive system office out of this. The, the students don't go to a system. They go to an institution to take a course or to have a longer term experience, whether that's in Castleton or at NVU or at CCV or at Vermont Tech. And those, the, the, the strengths that each of those institutions brings is, is to, uh, the goal is to optimize those strengths for those students and then to share those strengths in ways that are applicable 
because they're not all applicable across the board with others and to uh, with, the, with the sister institutions and to enforce, I'll use that term guardedly, but to enforce uh, the kind of collaborative and cooperative thinking that amongst the organization and, and throughout the organization that would encourage those kinds of collaborations. Uh, the cultural, the cultural piece is, 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 is much, you know, you can't write a memo and mandate that. So that really is an iterative piece. Uh, the light bulb goes on about, oh, wait a minute, we're in competition here. Maybe we shouldn't be. So that starts to change things. Another light bulb goes on, oh, what you're doing at CCV might make, with respect to adult students, make, might, might make real sense for us over here. How do we do that? Uh, there are other areas in which, for example, um, in, in, uh, in IT, where I think that you could work as a single, you know, the providing of certain basic infrastructure elements uh, could be a single uh, uh, way of doing it throughout the entire organization. So it's not a, it's, it, you have to look at uh, the organization in detail in terms of administration, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of academic programs and services, and you'll get different answers as to how those collaborations will develop depending upon which area you're looking. Uh, church. You're muted. Yep, yeah, I'm unmuted. Friends, I, I do have to leave. Um, I've got people out there who are calling from my head in a nice way. But Jim, I just want to say that uh, as I step away, it does give me comfort to know of your engagement. You're a level-headed, clear thinker. I think you just need to promise that if you see us drifting from the truth, that you will be very forthright and tell us to get back in line because um, we really need clear thinking, independent advice. And I think that you know us well enough, you know Vermont well enough, you're very well well suited to do that for us, and I appreciate it. And I and I really enjoy hearing you speak this afternoon. Thanks very much. And for everybody else, I've got to run. Thank, Thank you. you one sure. and Is there anyone else on the board that has a comment or question? Hey, Janet. Um, it when you were uh, speaking at the beginning of this, you were talking about you kind of implied that um, we were lean or working our way to being lean. Did I hear that correctly? Well, a, a, uh, let me put it this way. You don't have much, the, uh, you don't have much margin, marginal capacity for um, undertaking major, there's, 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 no, there's no margin operationally, financially, for you folks to fall back on. Um, and in that respect, lean. Now, I think some, some areas, and I don't know all of your areas at all, I did not have the opportunity, and it wasn't part of my charge to look at each area. I've seen some areas that I think are lean, and I think there are other areas that are not, but. Uh, okay, thank you, I just needed. But in, in, in part of that, it's, it's, it's I would encourage, I'm, I've been talking with the chancellor about this and uh, she's gonna get tired of me saying it. Um, one of the things that people, when they hear the word lean, they think of cuts or they think of too lean, they think of simple hires, uh, just adding to the current structure. Um, I would encourage you to be thinking functionally. Uh, what do you need to, what do you need to, carry out your responsibilities in a really good way, in a really high quality way, uh, in a functional way, rather than, uh, well, this campus needs two of these and that campus needs three of those. And if you think of that functionally rather than simply geographically, uh, you often come to different answers in terms of your resource allocations. I, I hope I'm not being too cryptic there. I, I don't intend No, I, I appreciate that and you know, I come from a more of a manufacturing background or a manufacturing background. Um, so lean to me means uh, two things, right? It's somewhat it's efficiency, but the other side is nimble. Yeah. You know? And yeah. Um, I, I think higher ed, particularly with our union structure, um, we're not very nimble. Um, and I think that's gonna challenge what we have 
how fast we can move even if we see where we need to go. Nimbleness is a very good thing. Is there anyone else that would like a question from the board? Because if not, I will, I'll Bill Lippert. Let's do Bill, because then we have some other people who want to ask questions. You're Thank muted, you. Bill. You're Thank you, Jim. I'm, um, I want to ask you to talk to us as a board for a minute and talk to us about um, what the realistic expectations can be for a board that is in fact a volunteer board uh, where everyone is engaged in other important uh, activities in their lives which require considerable time and attention. So that's, that's, that's the one issue, one part. And the second part is that a board, in my experience, and I've, I've, I've worked for boards and I've served on boards, but a board is a continually evolve, a continually, there's a constant turnover over time. I mean, today, Church has, is leaving the board. He's been the chair of the board and the leader of this board for some time. Uh, we know that there are uh, other board positions to be filled. Talk to us about what, how we address our own functioning and responsibilities given the demands on our lives. And at the same time, the expectations that the board fill this important responsibility. Uh, very, one of the, one of the uh, yes, one of the, the, the geniuses of the system of public hiring system is the system of trusteeship that we have of having uh, public volunteer public boards who represent the interests of the people who are investing their tax dollars and investing their family members in, in public higher education. Uh, so first of all, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough job. It's a necessary job. And it makes the system, in my mind, it makes the system really work. Uh, that's the easy, that's the, the bond apple pie piece. It, right. My board, it, it, the, the, my, the experience I had with my board, which was 16 people, so it's relatively similar in size. Um, you can always look, and there's certain operational things you can do around your agenda, around the time you spend, and around your committee structures. But if I was going to say two things that I would that I would recommend most highly for you in the, in the coming weeks, not even months, is to focus and determine amongst yourself uh, what the, the 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 key priority outcomes are, and not 12 of them some number between three and six, and then align, even if you don't, aren't able in that period of time to say, uh, this is the actual outcome we want in two years, but this is the category we're going to focus on and measure, and then align around those and align around how you're going to work with the chancellor and leadership for them to, uh, to work out, to manage those, to manage to those items. Um, all the rest of the stuff, the stuff you're doing, the rest of the agenda is key. You know, the Title IX and all the rest of this stuff is, is part of what you have to do. And it's a necessary and important. But for the, the general piece, the piece that I'm here to, to assist the Chancellor with is if I was going to ask two things of, of, of you, would be to focus and align and quickly. Focus around those strategic priorities. Measurable, external. Well, I would love to. Have, I would love to have further conversation about that. Okay, As Karen. A with you, Karen. Karen. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Page. You've you've um, so much information, um, and I take to heart. Uh, your advice about what our starting point should be with priorities and how we've been later built to structure. I want to pivot a couple of questions more, more from Janet's um, standpoint. And I come from a little different background than Janet, small business, uh, multi-generational business, 
where frequently we didn't have the resources or we were in jeopardy because of outside forces and we had to respond to survive. So we had to be creative and we had to make um, very real and sometimes painful assessments of changes that we had to make in order to survive. Um, and I know you have very astute, studied eyes. You come from a state that bears many similarities to ours. Um, we've got about 700,000 people here, maybe a little less. We don't have enough people to carry the water, so to speak. So we have very limited resources. And however much it would be nice for the legislature to come up with enough money to pay for, give us enough money so we can have free tuition or give us enough money so we can come up to speed with all the campuses we currently have. We all know that can't happen. It's not going to happen. There are competing needs in this state that are just as important as higher ed. Um, so I'd like, I'd like your thoughts about two things. You hit on some of the high expense areas that need to be looked at. And first of all, I wanna say, I understand we've gotta be focused on investment and on spending the resources we have well. But I also agree there's a very different very different, um, and when you talk about investment and investing in program, in my mind, that doesn't necessarily mean investing in real estate. Um, so we can invest in, in program and in program that's widespread to a variety of constituencies that we already have and that we need to develop and do that on a statewide basis. And that doesn't, I'm asking a question now, making a statement. That does not necessarily mean investing in real estate. Um, I, so, agree with, I agree with your statement question. Okay. And I have a question now, you know, nationally as well as regionally, what's happening with um, campus residency whether it's in Vermont or in other parts of the country, what, what the direction is there. So that's one area that I want, address, want you to address. So I'm, I'm basically asking you in a roundabout way, our real estate is an issue. We've got too much. Many have said we got too much real estate for a state of, of less than 700,000 people to realistically support long-term and that that might in fact get in the way of delivering program statewide to a wide range of constituencies. Um, the, second, the second thing, and I'm putting on my small business hat um, from my immigrant forebearers who had to make do and look around at where the customer base was and where they were going to pull in. Um, we are, for all practical purposes, the public, ex the, the public extension of higher education in the state of Vermont. That's really and truly what we are. And I'm not knocking UVM. I had a child who had a wonderful experience there, and it's a wonderful school, but it doesn't serve the same function as the VSC. Unfortunately, we're not regarded by as that, in my opinion. We're not treated like that. And we're not even treated like that by the pre-K through 12 system. And I raise this point. Um, when, <laughs> and it goes beyond early, early college, it goes beyond um, dual enrollment, which we have the seeds of. But if we're not really regarded by the legislature, and that'd be a good place to start, as the public extension of higher education, um, then a whole lot of things don't fall into place that ought to be the norm that would in fact fortify the VSC and give us that um, expanded service, statewide service to wide ranging constituencies. And something as small, and it's probably not real small, I noticed in my own home district, 
they were offering master's programs on site. And guess who the deliverer was? New Hampshire University, you know, the online. So I went to the then president of Castleton who had a nice online, he had a nice program. I said, how come you let them in our market? How did you let that happen? And I never got a really good answer, but I was really ruffled. And, and had I been in the position, I would have asked, I was the former chair of that school board, I would have asked the superintendent, what on earth are you thinking of? We've got a homegrown product. Why didn't you buy from the homegrown product? Why didn't you do that? And that's an area that needs to be looked at. Um, all right, I'm giving you my opinion now, and I shouldn't be doing that. What I'm asking is, I see a, con a confluence of things that we don't do that are uh, not productive here in the state of Vermont. Um, we're not spending the little bit of money we have well. We're not supporting one another. You know, if I want the grocery store in St. Albans to be successful, I have to trade there. I shouldn't be going to Burlington. I ought to be staying in St. Albans. And, and that's a point that I, so I, I asked you a bunch of things, but you have a sense of where I'm going. I think we're spending enough money pre-K through, through 16 in workforce development, but we're not spending it as a whole. We're not the only ones that don't have a systemic vision. The state of Vermont doesn't have a systemic vision. And we don't have enough money or enough people to not have a systemic vision. The, uh, there, are, there are quite a number of points that, <laughs> that I might address. Let me, let me hit on two or three. And if I miss something that's of particular importance, let me know. Um, first of all, and this is not necessarily in the order you presented them, uh, the fact and I can speak here to, to, to my experience in Maine. Um, you're not alone in sort of being the, uh, the, uh, the second, uh, too, too often feels like the second thought to students who go, want to go out of state. They want to go to a private, they want to do this. So the, the public doesn't think of the value proposition that Vermont State College too often doesn't think of the value proposition that the Vermont State College system brings to students. And their families and the communities. Um, a, a mentor of mine once said, you know, you do, you, you do all this work on Friday, go home and have a nice dinner with your family because on Monday you've got no money in the bank. And the shelf life now of getting these messages across to our citizens is about the weekend long. It's a story that has to be, con the value that, that, that VSC and it's, it's, it's all of its people's programs, places brings, has to be continually in the front of the people of Vermont on an on a ongoing basis. Uh, the days when any institution can take, well, Harvard, okay, uh, can, take, can take their reputation as sufficient is, is long over for any public institution. Uh, most, most immediately, the regionals and the regional comprehensives but ultimately the, the, the flagships are coming under these kinds of pressures as, as well. So uh, having, having a robust set of messages, uh, robust, aggressive, and what we're doing for you, not what we've done for you for a hundred years, what are we doing for you now uh, needs to be out there on a continual basis. And what are we going to do? How are we organizing ourselves so that six months from now, we're gonna do it even better. In a year, we're gonna do it even better and have those things out in front. Uh, your, your experience with Southern New Hampshire University is one that is being shared throughout the country. Um, their marketing budget is bigger, almost as big as your entire budget for your system. Um, well, it's, 100, it's over $130 million they're spending on marketing every year. But part of that is they have an incredible, uh, if, you, if you call up, if you go online, to Southern New Hampshire and start looking and poking around on their website, within 60 seconds, you will get an approach from one of somebody who 
understands the entire system and is aggressively going to try to initiate a conversation with you. And those people are so well trained that they're going to be able to answer any question that you have uh, on the spot. They can turn around and make admissions decisions in, in hours and days, not weeks and months. Um, so especially for students who are older or who haven't been necessarily right on a college track along, the lessons that you can learn, even though you'll never be able to position to match Southern New Hampshire in terms of their, of their uh, uh, marketing and their resources they can bring to the table. But advising is something that they've, they, they're one of the organizations that have created an art form of advising. And advising now is being shown to be uh, critical in retaining uh, students. And I was a faculty member at one time long ago and I was a reluctant advisor. And advising meant, oh, let's look at your course list. Advising stopped meaning that a long time ago. Uh, the University of Southern Maine has a very, very robust advising program. Uh, I'm a little out of date with some of its details, but when I left the institution last year, uh, every incoming student uh, had a, nine, a mandatory 90 minute one-on-one -on -one with an advisor who took them through every as every educational, social, and financial aspect of being at the university. And when they left, not only did they have a complete, when the student left, not only did they have a complete accounting of what they could have for support services, but they had a person they could go to and they knew who to call for any element. These are professional advisors. Now, that's not the entire answer. These things are, these things are complicated, but in Southern New Hampshire, we learned that from Southern New Hampshire University, uh, or a version of that. Those are the sorts of things that when getting back to an earlier point, uh, the resources of any single institution within the Vermont State College system may not be able to support that kind. But if you start working together, pooling expertise and pooling resources on that, now you've got a fighting chance without having to go spend a lot more money that you don't have. Uh, on, on residencies, uh, facilities, I was actually speaking earlier today with the Chancellor and some of her staff. Uh, you, have a, you have a very substantial deferred maintenance charge um, that there is no way of exactly clearing, uh, clearing the boards of uh, financially. Uh, but when you don't have, although uh, I was encouraged that you might be not too far away from it, but uh, at the moment, you don't have an easy access to data that, that talks about the readiness of the, your, those, the value of those facilities. What are the net asset values? You know, what do they take to maintain? What do they take to bring up to speed? Not just in terms of internet wiring uh, or Wi-Fi, but in terms of, of HVAC systems or heating, you know, heating and, and roofs, et cetera. That I was encouraging the, the, to think of, get, get, get some data in on that so that you can make, so that the board can make some, some rational decisions about facility usage um, and uh, where, where, where you can transition to uh, in whatever, whatever form that is uh, over the next several years, whatever the education and program delivery requirements are. So uh, I was encouraged, as I said, to say here that you've, you've got people on the ground who know a lot of that stuff, but it needs to be put together in a, in a coherent, cohesive and comprehensive way. I, I probably missed a couple of your other points. I hope we have more opportunities in the plural <laughs> um, to converse. And, and just before um, the pre-K, I, I would like you to address this and maybe you don't have a thought about it, but um, it seems to me in a small state with limited resources and great needs, we might be spending our dollars. And I, I've heard, I've heard tell, as they say in Vermont on the farm, that um, people in the legislature are wondering, maybe we should be looking at a whole public education spec spectrum plan. And now that we have pre-K, it would be pre-K through workforce. Um, development and and that we would have a plan as to how that works and perhaps that plan would even include the partly empty buildings we have across the state in high schools and in tech centers to help spread higher ed throughout the state um, in a more holistic way 
we got a lot of resources here that aren't being highly utilized because of our demographic changes. So I don't know if you've had time to ponder. I know people slapped me on the head and said, we have unions and we can't even deal with the unions we have. You want to tap the NEA at pre-K through 12 too? <laughs> well, I think the, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a huge topic. And it, 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 I do think that the line, the old traditional line between 12th grade and post-secondary is becoming increasingly porous and artificial. The growth of the, the successful growth in most places of uh, early college dual enrollment speak to that. Um, also, the fact that there's a, there's there is an increasing need for the ability to get people in to get credentialed in a way that's short of a full degree, and maybe you stack those credentials to get a degree in the end. But having the having the resources of, and I mean primarily the human resources, I'm, the capital resources are different, that's a political matter. But the human resources of, of, of K-12, uh, you know, putting their heads together with, with the colleges, whether two year or four year, and looking at ways, you have, you're like Maine, you have a great high school edu uh, graduation rate and a relatively, to many other states, a relatively poor uh, number of students going on to post-secondary education. Uh, there's, the reasons for those are very complicated and tough nuts to crack, but you've got to think, I've got to think uh, that a, a K-12 system working in some form in tandem and cooperatively with two-year and four-year programs have an opportunity to break into that 35, 40%, whatever your current number is, in a way that would make a real difference to the state. There's a history of, of you know, I, I, one of the things that when I first became chancellor, I heard a horrible star, story that horrified me of, of, of a, of a, of a K-12, of a, a, a city system, a K-12 system going to the university and saying, what can we do to help? You know, what can we do to do, do things better? And the answer was send us better students. And that was, that was, you know, th that was such a poor, frankly, stupid way to, to, to start a discussion. It was the best way to kill us discussion that could have been productive. Thanks a lot. Are there any other board members that have a question? Because I have people who want to have other questions. All right, if not, I have, uh, President Moulton from VTC, who has a question for you, Mr. Page. Well, thank you very much, Chair Dickinson, and congratulations in your new role to all. Um, it's less of a, a question and more of a comment. Um, as Jim knows, he had an opportunity to meet with uh, the presidents to discuss the single budgeting process. And I'm, I'm going back to the earlier conversation regarding culture change. And one of the things that I had brought up as I understood, as he was describing, the process is, I mean, our process may be very similar, but what's missing is one of the cultural aspects is complete candor uh, between and amongst the presidents and with the chancellor, uh, particularly when we might see a particular president going down a path that is ill-advised. Um, the best example I could provide was the possible purchase of the Green Mountain College campus. And um, that I, we weren't, um, open and fully candid in that discussion. And that's something I think we're going to need to do. The other thing you spoke of, Jim, too, was in that single budgeting process that there may be an institution that any given year may need greater resources for whatever reason than another institution. And therefore, the allocation of resources may not be the same every year, given what might be happening with members of the system. And I, you know, I'm willing to, um, I would expect that if any of us would expect that certain resources to our institution would be diminished to help either bail out or provide some additional resources to another institution, we're all gonna be pretty well motivated to speak up um, to our sisters um, and brothers when they are doing something that we might find to be ill-advised. And so, and I would expect I would provide that and I would expect I would get that. And I'll just want to just say for the record, I think more of the systemness thinking and function has been doing really well since Sophie has taken the reins. Um, she's told some of us no. Um, she has forced us to go back to the drawing board. Um, and I think 
it's it's working. We're seeing it happen in a lot of our COVID response. So to your point about culture change, Jim, you can't send a memo to make it happen, but you can get the um, tone from the top. And Sophie has made that very clear. And I think we're all going to see improvements. And I just want to give the board some assurance of that from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else with questions? Chair Dickinson, I do have a, a faculty member that would like to say something. Are, are we opening up to, the, it, to them yet, or do you want to wait? Well, um, <clears throat> we still have a lot to go. Um, we will have public comment at the end, and um, I'm sure at that point we'd be happy to hear the faculty members. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank we'll you. Okay, not seeing any further questions from the board. Um, we do have a second thing under the report of the Long Range Planning Commission. It is the report on initial recommendations of the VSC Forward Task Force. And uh, I'll turn to the Chancellor. Uh, does she want her to do um, some of the material on that? With Yasmin Beisler. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to turn it over to Yasmin. Yasmin's been serving as the chair for the VSCS Forward Task Force. Um, I'm, I'm sure many, I'm, I'm, I don't remember exactly, but I know a lot of trustees participated on July 23rd when we had the Long Range Planning Committee meeting and we heard from a number of, of groups and stakeholders um, at that time. Um, I know the task force has worked extraordinarily hard. Um, we gave them or the board gave them direction back at the beginning of July, uh, July 1st, in terms of a charge to them on what they wanted what you wanted to hear from them. And uh, you asked to get a, a report back and some preliminary recommendations by August 14th. So that's sort of what this meeting is, is partly about. Um, I will say the ground has moved somewhat since then back in, uh, as of uh, June 1st, we didn't yet have the report from Jim Page. We didn't have the report from the state treasurer's office. We didn't have any bridge funding. We didn't have uh, the additional CRF funds that the legislature gave us in the uh, first quarter transitional budget. So things have, have evolved somewhat since then, but I, I, I just want to commend all the uh, work and effort that has been done by the task force. They have been meeting twice a week since the beginning of June. They've had difficult, contentious, uh, hard conversations. They've participated in that. I stepped out of attending those meetings uh, once I became the uh, the chancellor because I didn't want to inhibit their conversations and I was concerned that I would be a distraction if I was part of the meetings, but I am aware of, of how much work they have done. Um, so I just, I, I just wanted to thank them all individually to the extent they're here on the call um, and let them know how much we appreciate the time and effort that they've put into this. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Yasmin, uh, who's gonna be going through their, their report back to the board. Great. Th thank you, Sophie. And I'm going to um, I am going to share a PowerPoint here with you all. Um, and I will do my best. I understand you've you've been meeting for quite a while now. So I'm going to do my best to uh, to move through it. Um, but do uh, pause and interrupt me if you have questions along the way. Um, just one last thing to echo to to Sophie's thanks, you know, um, there's been a lot of conversation this afternoon about culture and culture change. For those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm an anthropologist by training. So, um, so I think a lot about this and I would say a hallmark of this task force's work. It's a, it's a broadly representative group, um, but it's a group that has really um, learned from each other's distinct cultures and the distinct cultures of our students that we serve. Uh, so there's been a lot of, of you know, listening uh, and thinking and walking in each other's shoes, I think, through these past six weeks. So I, I thank everybody for that. Um, to, oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, my slides are not advancing. Okay. So uh, just very briefly, I think the, the pieces that the task force um, in looking at the charges the board has given them, these are the kinds of things that have been guiding our conversations, accessibility and affordability, um, and recognizing we serve quite a range of students. Um, 
I will say finally that the task force has, these have been challenging conversations because people recognize the need for change, but it's also actually been quite um, positive and invigorating. There's a lot of ability to reimagine the future, um, a future that's robust, that has some creative new solutions, um, and that is sustainable. So um, people are, are quite optimistic, I would say, in this task force about our, our ability to pull this off. And again, apologies here. I think I'm gonna have to just bear with me for one second. Um, oh, I can still see you all. Okay, great. Um, so three things I want to cover with you all today. The first is um, we did just a week ago or so a, a very broad-based stakeholder survey, and I want to uh, talk you through some of the results. It was incredible participation. Um, and then I wanna review the charges the board gave the task force and the initial recommendations we have. Um, and then fin finally, just um, return to this theme of affordability because it's really a place for a whole lot more work as, as we've talked about, or as you've all talked about today. Um, so the survey um, with a particular thanks to Rich Clark for helping us with this. Um, this went out to all of our internal stakeholders, um, as well as we sent it out to the lists that we have of high school partners, as well as employer workforce development partners. And as you can see just from the numbers, we have robust partnerships across the state. And we had an amazing response, over 2,400 responses in just five days. That represents, Rich Clark tells me, over 400 hours that Vermonters contributed to give us feedback. Um, so a big thank you to uh, everyone who, who took the time because there were, I would say there's probably in terms of text, at least a hundred pages of comments. Um, we asked people some more quantitative questions about priorities that I'll share with you. Um, and then I, I think we hope to follow up with more detail on the kind of qualitative strengths and opportunities that people articulated, but I'll, I'll give you a little feel for that right now. Uh, in terms of priorities, um, this uh, chart shows you overall, um, we saw incredible consistency between our uh, own folks, students and staff, faculty and administration, as well as our external partners in the business and who identified themselves as business and community members. Um, so these were how the priorities shook out, um, you know, starting at the top with affordability and access. So I'll give you just a, a moment there to kind of read. I would, won't read you the entire slide, but to just to give you a moment on that. Um, the next um, thing we did ask more specifically are uh, employer partners um, about workforce alignment. We know that's a really critical part of the work we do. And uh, satisfaction with our uh, graduates. Um, people are generally satisfied. Um, and oops, I apologize. Um, people identified, you know, need for more hands-on experience, more focus on communication skills. Um, but overall, some strong satisfaction about what the VSC is doing. Um, Jim, you used you used the word irreplaceable gem, and that is true in the perceptions of our stakeholders. We also asked some questions very specifically of our school counselor partners. Um, and we did send a targeted, you know, K-12 partners, VSEC outreach counselors um, in particular. So to the question of why are students choosing us, affordability, and this, this is, I think, primarily school counselors thinking about a traditional student right after high school. Affordability, close to home, and the small welcoming communities we have at all of our institutions. Um, conversely, there, there are Vermonters uh, who are not choosing us. And it's really because they're looking for something other than that. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking in some cases for something more affordable or perceived to be more affordable or greater value and leaving Vermont. Uh, Jim talked about that earlier. Uh, and then finally, I just wanna return um, to highlight just from a, through a student lens of the priorities. Um, students really were consistent with everyone else in the priorities they articulated. Um, and so that was, that was really quite striking. I will say we, 
It was over 600 students who responded. Um, and while I don't have more detail right here for you on the kind of opportunities um, and strengths that students in particular articulated, I would say we, we did see a, um, a real distinctiveness between a, a, a student population that wanted a traditional residential experience and uh, students who were really looking for um, a variety of things around flexibility, around distance delivered education that, that helped them uh, maintain employment while they were going to school, um, shorter term credentials. So, so within these priorities, we do, we do have two distinct student populations. Um, we asked students to reflect particularly on opportunities uh, or everyone in light of what's happening with the pandemic. And I would say a, a, a theme that we started to talk about was, you know, to be virtual or not. We saw a lot more interest and uh, recognition of the possibilities of delivery through some virtual means that were, if I could paraphrase a student, something like not the old way of doing online education. So um, students are recognizing that we're, we're doing a lot of new things. We've adapted very quickly in the pandemic and there's, there's more opportunity there. Um, I will pause there if, if there's any immediate um, thought or comment. Otherwise, I'll move on to charges and our recommendations. Yeah. Okay, so you charged us with uh, pro looking at addressing program duplication, ensuring quality, financial viability, and access. Um, and I will say at the start that um, we talked a lot about what does program duplication mean, because I think for some people that immediately goes to academic programs, our task force continually talked about a range of kinds of things that could be duplicated, functional areas, ways of doing things. So, um, so we did look at that broadly. And the first recommendation here, uh, however, does focus on the academics and the recognition that where we have academic program overlap, it's, it's between Castleton and Northern Vermont University. Um, and so really uh, looking at ways to do things better and different um, would really best come from a group focused on that. Um, so our recommendation to the board is, is that you, you charge a group uh, to move forward. Um, and look at how are you preserving access to programs, it, things like consortium agreements, consolidation of programs to single majors are some of the things we talked about. And of course, new uh, hybrid and telepresence kind of delivery models. Um, the group, I would say with all of our recommendations, the task force has a sense of urgency and the need while this is really difficult work to keep working as, as expeditiously as possible. So that is our first recommendation. Uh, the second recommendation, again, recognizes, and I would think some of the words uh, that we talked about in the task force around CCV and Vermont Tech in particular, there's a lot of symbiosis already and a lot of possibility. Um, our task force really sees a lot of potential um, for additional sharing, collaboration, and expansion of, of program offerings in some of the co-located spaces or spaces that could become more co-located uh, in terms of delivery of programs. So again, um, charging those two institutions to, to work further on this um, and identify what, what could be done next um, is a recommendation. And then two more recommendations on, this, on these same charges. Um, and I will say that these recommendations also were really consistently echoed in, com in the um, opportunities and uh, section of, of the narrative comments that we received. Um, first is to develop a single general education program core, um, make this as transparent and consistently available as we can. And obviously doing that online helps achieve that. And then also looking at how we're delivering our course offerings now that we're doing them in so many different ways and coming up with a single uh, approach or structure or ways for students to see what's available to them um, to be taking a full advantage of the system. I know, I know the board has talked about that a lot. Um, I think we're at a new stage of how do we do that operationally now that we have a whole lot more that we figured out how to offer. 
And so with that, I will pause again. <laughs> um, Final, I, the final two charges, I will say, really represent more of a work in progress. And essentially, the recommendations here from the task force are that we, we need a, a deeper dive on data. And I think some of the conversation um, that the board has had with Jim uh, just now speaks to this as well. So this is uh, our fifth recommendation is really about looking at the day, data in detail around our physical um, facilities, uh, and the task force really wants to highlight there are a lot of opportunities here to look at doing things creatively. So we just, um, and we received a lot of good ideas. Uh, and I know in some cases they're already under very active discussion um, at some of our institutions. So that is our fifth recommendation. And then finally, um, this question of how should the system be configured? And I think our task force recognizes that um, form should follow function. Uh, that said, uh, Jim, our task force, I think everyone read your report in, in pretty close detail. And uh, there was pretty universal uh, recognition that the moving from a federation of institutions to a true interconnected system is where we need to go. Um, but that said, there's a lot of work to really figure out what would be the right approach here. The task force very preliminarily uh, talked about kind of a range of models and um, what those could look like from single accreditation to kind of down the spectrum. So, um, but really uh, the task force needs more time. And I think I will close on that note of data and time to say they are committed to keep working if that is the pleasure of the board. Um, and I appreciate that because these are busy people. Uh, finally, to, to come back to this theme of affordability, uh, obviously, if, if this is a true priority for us to address in anything the system does, um, that's, we should be operating through that lens of that priority and resource allocation. There are a lot of exciting ideas of ways that uh, we can do this both within our system and, and with, uh, in partnership with the state and state policy. And I, so this list represents some of the things the task force um, pulled out both from input and talked about itself um, as things that would really help address affordability for our students. So with that, I will stop sharing so I can see you all a little bit better um, and see if there are any questions at this point. Does anyone on the board have any questions of Yasmin? Karen? Just, just I, wish I, I wish you could hear me applauding. It's wonderful, wonderful work. And um, just wonderful work. I can't thank everyone enough. And it took some courage to put some of these proposals or thoughts out there. Mm -hmm. I think we need to um, move ahead. I think we need to do more work. And I think, I think the thoughts are going in a very good and productive direction. And I think they offer promise of, um, of moving, moving the Vermont State College system ahead to a new future. So I, it gives me great reason for optimism. And thank you so much, all of you. And Yasmin, you did a great job. Thank you, Karen. I, I will say this has been a courageous group who's really pushed themselves in each other. So thank you for using that word. We're going to need a lot more courage, too, before we're done, all of us. Yeah. I have a question. Um, Yasmin, is it possible to get that PowerPoint and distribute that to the board members? Uh, I don't believe that was in our package, and it would be yeah. right. quite seriously to take notes, but I think that we really need to be able to look at that with a little more, a little more time. Ab absolutely. And, you know, part of the reason for that is simply that the task force was working through this morning, too. <laughs> and I was waiting for, for some final thoughts from people. So, yes, we will get that to you right after the meeting. That was really very, very helpful. And the survey results were really, really interesting, too. 
Yeah. I, you know, one thing I probably went a little too quickly, but I'll just say is that I think the task force people who were spent more time with the survey results think there's there's a lot of potential there for those to be useful to the board going forward, potentially to the legislature. It's it's a treasure trove of of information as well as, you know, good candid feedback. So yeah, one of the things that you mentioned is that the two different kinds of students, both the more traditional high school students and the more um, other students, adult students, non-traditional, the, the non-traditional, right. the traditional and the non-traditional. In the survey results, they did show differences. Can you break that down for us as well? At least not in my minute granular detail right. of something so we can see that difference. Right. I, I think that the difference really came out in the comments. So students who were fall in that traditional category said things like, I really value learning from my peers and, and seeing them face to face and having those daily interactions. I value the richness of that campus experience. Yeah. Uh, and, and the po well, I would say post-traditional students are saying, I really value the fact that I can take so many of my classes online, that mm -hmm. I don't have to travel too far. So, you know, I really value the certificates. I value the, the friendly welcoming. Everybody values the friendly welcoming, you know, high quality personal service. Mm -hmm. um, but those are, those are the big distinctions. Yeah. So I think we could probably figure that out, but it would be nice yeah. to see the actual data. Okay. Sure. Thank you. sure. Yeah. Anyone else have any other questions? Let me see. Adam is up on the list. Great. Uh, thank you. I just want to uh, echo Karen's compliments. Yasmin, that was uh, really great work to see. Um, and I think also picking up on those two different uh, students theme. I was really surprised by the low number or the low ranking of the importance of residential experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder as, as we dive deeper into that data, if it was just a higher percentage of off campus students who responded. Uh, that drove that, that difference there, mm -hmm. or if our, our students just are not valuing that as significantly uh, as, as other, you know, for example, access to a, a counselor. Um, that seems to be a big disparity there. Right. That's a great question, Adam, and we'll flag that for follow-up for you. Um, I will say that broad, generally speaking, um, I think we saw a very good representation across all of our campuses and students who responded. I should put a big shout out to Alex, our student member on the, the uh, group who was really good at uh, getting communication out about participation. So we did see robust participation that I think is broadly proportional to our student enrollments. Great, so, and then, uh, you know, yeah. I think just flagging that for future uh, understanding is because we hear so much about the importance of either the access uh, or the importance of having that residential opportunity close. So understanding that data, I think will be important as we move forward. The other point I just want to make, uh, it's not really a question, is just that last slide um, really for the board to start thinking about how we can reach outside of, of the system and bring other partners that will really be key in advancing that more pre-K through, you know, 16 uh, system, <clears throat> excuse me, and how we can start making sure that we're bringing those folks into the conversations that we're having as a board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does the board have any more questions for Yasmin? It doesn't appear at the moment. Um, I just want to say, Beth Walsh, you have your hand up <clears throat> and, um, I would like to hear what you have to say. Well, and the same with Linda, who now has her hand up. Um, we had a person from the faculty who wanted to speak in the last part of our presentation. And I think what I'm going to have to do, I don't want to play favorites here or have someone get a chance to speak and not have had other people chance to speak. We're going to save those comments. I've made notes that we're going to do this in public comment. Um, and we do still have stuff to do here. So just hold on to that and we will get back to you when it comes to public comments. I'm making a note for all of you. Um, anyone else? The public has any other comments? We will get back to you when we get to public comments. Um, okay, so that would take care of the report of the Long Range Planning Committee. Thank you very much, Yasmin. We now are going to the report of the Finance and Fil Facilities Committee. Uh, we had a meeting as well, was it last week? Just 
It was July 23rd. Yes, it was. It feels like it, they all blend together. Um, so we have some uh, policy changes that we discussed, and uh, I guess I'll turn to uh, Sharon St uh, Sharon Scott to start to start with and go from there. Well, I'm actually going to turn this right over to David. And uh, David, if you have things that you would like me to convey, I'm happy to do so. Sure. I'll, I'll uh, take it from here. So uh, as Lynn said, we had a, a very productive uh, meet, uh, finance and facilities committee meeting on July 23rd. And yes, it it, it was a little ways uh, back, but it, everything seems, the time seems to be jumbled up. So um, we were very pleased to, to have um, Sharon join us as our uh, system uh, chief financial officer. Uh, I feel and I think the committee feels that we're in very good hands with her uh, leading the finance team. Um, you know, unfortunately, that is uh, NVU's loss, but the system's gain, but we're very happy to have her on board. Uh, and we have had some productive, uh, very productive discussions. Um, I'd like to echo Dr. Page's uh, comments and just uh, sort of summarize it in a very two or three word se se uh, sentence, which is essentially uh, no margin, no mission. Um, and we really need to focus on that. Uh, so we have a few, what I would call house, or at least one uh, housekeeping item uh, that we need to attend to. And it's related to a grant for the Community College of Vermont. Uh, this is their early childhood professional development system uh, grant that comes through from the state. And this uh, really is a uh, increase in the dollar value from a million three sixty five to a million four thirty and change. And um, really, there's a also an increase in the value of the grant, also an expectation for a, a bit of a larger scope of services. Um, under our uh, grant guidelines, uh, I think it's uh, any grant over a million dollars needs to be approved by the full board. And so to that end, I would actually make the motion that we approve uh, the increase or the amendment of that grant. Uh, second on that. Second that. Adam, the second. Any discussion? Okay. Um, all those in favor of the um, the approval of the uh, the grant for, to one one point four three plus million, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any any no's? Okay, it appears that that passes. Uh, go ahead, David. What's next? Okay, terrific. So, uh, we had a fairly lengthy conversation uh, at at our committee about the role of the chancellor. And, and her designees with regards to the financial processes of the system, uh, focusing on budget as well as uh, CapEx and other um, material expenditures. And particularly in the current environment, but even going forward as we try to change um, our culture uh, with regards to uh, working more as a system and less as a confederation, uh, we are proposing some changes to several of our policies that deal with our finances to essentially uh, provide some of those things. Uh, particularly, uh, there's a uh, amendment that's proposed for policy 403. That is the system annual operating budget. Um, the primary change there is really dealing with some of the COVID funds that are coming in, uh, where uh, we're looking to have those funds be spent at the authority of the chancellor's office, which we think is a more, appro uh, more is appropriate rather than having that being decided upon college by college or university by university. That was the most material change, right, Sharon? That is the most material change. So it would be any extraordinary expense uh, monies coming in, such as the CRF money, 
um, bridge funding or others. Um, so that would that's the purpose of that language change. You know, the second change is in our uh, policy 429, which is uh, regarding uh, contracts and how we let contracts and so on and so forth. And essentially really what we're looking to do is going forward is that any expenditure that represents spending $100,000 over the course of 12 months that uh, in addition to the campuses providing approval that those be passed through the chancellor's office for uh, confirmation or approval before they're actually uh, executed. So, you know, from my perspective in the business we're in, uh, you know, we certainly have limits on uh, where authorities lie and the highest levels go to a higher level. So that is something that uh, we're proposing. Finally, does that pretty well cover it, Sharon? That does indeed. Okay. And finally, we were looking simply to reaffirm policy 407, which talks about deficits incurred and the obligation of the colleges to essentially follow their budgets. So I guess I would entertain some questions if there are any for Sharon or I or Sophie. Adam has a question. Yeah, uh, David, and just looking at this, does that mean that the chancellor's office would be receiving uh, the bids for anything that are exceeding $100,000 and approving the bids as well as approving the spending of the money? I would presume that if we're in a bid situation that, that the, the summary of those bids would be presented to the chancellor's office. I'm not sure whether they would actually vet the bids specifically, but I think that's procedural rather than policy. Well, so the, the, the red line or the blue line version here uh, has the insertion and then below it, it says purchases or leases exceeding 100,000 um, require competitive bidding. So it seems like we're getting a two for here. The, the so the, the existing yeah. policy does already require um, a, either a competitive bid uh, over, so an RFP over $100,000 or over $25,000, a competitive bid process, unless there's a sole source. The additional language is intended to offer the opportunity for the chancellor to weigh in when there's an anticipated expenditure that's anticipated to exceed $100,000 in terms of total transactions. Today, there is already a process for the deans of administration or president or chancellor, depending on the location, to approve specific individual transactions. But when you're talking about a total transaction that could be occurring over multiple months or multiple versions of transactions over a period of time, the opportunity for the chancellor to weigh in and confirm that it's an expenditure that's appropriate or to have the opportunity to really look at that as a system-wide expenditure is that something that would uh, be of benefit across the system where we may be able to do that with greater economies of scale um, and deploy more resources across the system as a whole. So that's the, the purpose of adding the additional language. Okay. I, would, I would just add in, and this is to echo what Pat Moulton had said previously, was we have already through the Council of Presidents and the Business Affairs Council been vetting proposals that individual institutions have been thinking about entering into um, for two reasons. One, um, the cost, um, does it make sense? But also, if it makes sense for one college, one campus, does it make sense to actually extend that across the whole system? And I will um, give a shout out to our enrollment folks who've been working extremely hard to actually um, you know, come together in terms of um, working collectively to get some economies of scale in terms of contracts that we're looking at um, for, for services. So we're already um, moving in that direction. And I think as, as Pat indicated, you know, sometimes the answer is no, but sometimes um, it's yes. And we've had wonderful collaboration from presidents who are like, oh, you're thinking of that, we're doing this and being able to just be more um, efficient and thoughtful and creative about how we approach things. So I really want to commend the presidents and the Business Affairs Council for, for their willingness um, to start talking frankly and openly about some of these things, because I think we're already starting to see some benefits from that approach. 
Yes, Linda. Uh, it feels as and um, as though I'm hearing that a lot of this cooperation, um, acting more system like that we're hearing is somewhat in actually how you're working together. It wasn't specifically um, because of changes in the policy or things like that. Would that be a correct understanding? Policy has not actually yet taken effect yet because you haven't right. voted on it. But as right. we were discussing earlier, this is part of culture and tone at the top. Sophie has been really very, um, uh, strongly working with all of us and the institutions to look at things as a system-wide approach where possible, where that makes sense and is efficient. This actually just undergirds that same sense of culture and allows us to be able to have a policy behind it as well as the cultural aspect. So I was trying to, as I read the policy changes there, I guess, especially on the budgeting side, I was trying to grasp, okay, so what is the change here that really more encourages the schools to be working together rather than competing with each other? And I guess I was well, one a of little the thick and not fully grasping it. So Sharon, you probably have your finger on the pulse of that. So one of the things that you might have noticed or grasped from the policies that were presented to you is that there were not very many red lines or blue lines. Um, listed on those specific policies. And that is because those policies already gave the authority to the chancellor to develop a system-wide budget. In fact, it's called a system annual operating budget in policy 403. Mm -hmm. However, the practical matter of the fact is that historically that has been delegated to the independent institutions as four or five strong ind independent institutions. Um, who work together as a confederation, as a system. But um, what we have been asking for as part of this is to say, culturally, we're making the shift to move towards this. We already have the authority to be able to do so, but we're asking the board to reaffirm that authority, number one. That's why we didn't ask for those changes, but then modest tweaks to just reflect the reality of where we live today. Thank you, sir. I knew you'd have your finger on us, Sharon. Help, thanks. Anyone else have any more questions or discussion about your, uh, uh, Sharon or uh, Trustee Silverman or anyone? Okay, we have a, um, a resolution. Um, would the chair of the Finance and Facilities Committee like to uh, make a motion to accept, accept that resolution? Assuming that everybody has access to it in their board package, um, I would uh, like to dispense with the reading of it uh, since it's rather lengthy, but I would make a motion uh, for resolution number 2020-014, establishing a system-wide budget. I would uh, move to approve. Do I hear a second? Linda seconding, okay. Any further discussion on it? Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor of, a, of uh, approving resolution number 2020-014, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Here's it's passed. Thank you very much. Now, um, we do have an executive session. Um, this should not be a very long one, I hope. Um, Megan, do you have the um, the motion on that that you can share with us, please? You have to unmute yourself. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Um, excellent. I move the VSC Board of Trustees enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313A2 to discuss negotiating or securing real estate purchase or lease options, along with the members of the board present at this meeting. In its, in its discretion, the board invites the chancellor, the presidents of the Vermont Technical Colleges, Dean of Administration of Vermont Technical College, the VSC Chief Financial Officer, Chief Operating Officer, and the VSC General Counsel to attend. 
the board may, as appropriate and permitted by law, take action regarding real estate during this executive session. Okay. Um, is there a second of the motion? Second. Okay. Even. Um, any further discussion on the motion to go into executive session? Not hearing any, uh, we are going to vote. Uh, everybody's in favor of going into executive session. Please say aye. 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 Uh, any and opposed? Not hearing any, we're going to pursue the same situation. We're going to go into a breakout room. Is Jen Poirier going to help us do that? Yes, you will receive your invitation. There it is. Okay. Everyone can remain where they are and we'll be back soon. Same situation public, remain here. The trustees will be back shortly. Okay, I wanna thank everybody for being patient. We're back again. Um, one of the things that I did not realize was an action item that um, we need to act on as a board, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is on the report of the Long Range Planning Committee, the initial recommendations of the VSCS forward task force, they gave recommendations to the board. Um, we'll ask for a motion uh, to uh, accept the recommendations, the first four recommendations and have a discussion or questions after that. Madam Chair. Yes, Karen. So move. I so move. Karen, I'll move that we accept the first four recommendations of the of the forward task force. A second on that, please. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a, a motion and a second on moving forward on the first the recommendations. They're looking at a date of October 1st that we want to allow them to continue to work on with the chancellor and um, our academic leader and with um, the CFO So and work with them as well. Any, any further questions or discussions? Yeah, could I just get a quick um, summary? Are these, thing, are these four action items things the board will do, chancellor's office will do? Just a brief summary, please. I can, I, can, I can read them quickly for you. So um, it was that the board would direct me as the chancellor uh, first to create a combined Castleton Northern Vermont University Academic Affairs Group to develop clear evaluation criteria for review of duplicate and low enroll programs, including a proposal for a consolidation, increased investment and or closure with consideration being given to prioritize student access to programs through different delivery models. So that was the first charge they had re requested. The second was um, again for the board to, to direct me to charge the Community College of Vermont and Vermont Technical College jointly to develop a plan to consolidate back office operations and expand program offerings in co-located spaces. The third one was to charge the chief academic officer in coordination with the faculty chairs of each institution's general education curriculum committee to develop a single general education program core that is available to students online. And the fourth was to charge the chief academic officer in coordination with the BSES registrars and business affairs council to provide a single framework for students to access online, remote or telepresence course offerings across the system. And the first two of those, um, the, the task force had requested um, have an October 1st deadline. And then I think the anticipation is that the task force would be reporting back to the board and requesting further direction from the board uh, moving forward. Thanks, that's helpful. Any further questions or discussions? Yes, yes, Bill Lippert. Um, I, I would like to, and this, is, this has to do with this, but it has to do with the broader issues we've talked about today with Jim Page. Um, I, I would like to ask that the chancellor in perhaps in consultation with the chair of the Long Range Planning Com Committee or whomever she chooses to provide the board with a, an overview of the various Projects, the various committees that are looking into the future of the VSCS and to articulate the manner in which these, these ranges of input are going to be uh, brought 
together uh, as we move forward with a time with a, a, a timetable. And um, because it's, it's one thing for us to say, yes, let's adopt these four recommendations. But do these four recommendations fly in the face of the recommendations from somebody else? And, uh, and that may be, and we make choices. And that's okay. But I think where we set in motion, whether it's a select committee that the, or the legislature sets in motion, a select committee, or we have the VSCS forward committee, there, there are a range of groups saying we're looking to the future of the VSCS. And I think we need to have an overview uh, of the way we intend to take that information into ourselves as the board and make a single set of recommendations moving forward. Uh, I personally would find that very helpful. And I would ask, like to ask the chancellor to use this process and working perhaps with uh, Mike Pichek or the Long Range Planning, whomever is best suited to do that, Yasmin, to say, this is how we're going to bring everything into alignment uh, and review the recommendations and make choices. Madam Chair. Um, I, I, uh, we, we are inundated with information, Bill, I agree. But I recall in the myriad of information we got just in the past week, there was such a concise, the, the chancellor did send just a concise explanation slash definition with for each group. For, for each group. Yes. And my understanding, and I stand corrected if, if I'm misunderstanding, but my understanding was that for lack of better uh, nomenclature, Yasmin's group was the catch-all. <laughs> Okay, well, that's that's not been clear to me, and so that's that would that would be very helpful. I, I have to say, I have been highly preoccupied. Uh, <laughs> I know, seriously, I know. seriously, I've been highly preoccupied with uh, uh, I know. a re-election campaign that's occupied most of my everything, and so if I miss that, I apologize. But I, that's that that would meet the need for then for me of what I'm requesting, and you can say, job done. Thank you, Chancellor, <laughs> I because I really did appreciate you articulating what what each group's role was and uh, because I think there has been, at least for me, and I'm sure it's not just for me, there's been some confusion as to who's, what name stands for what and who's doing what. But uh, thank you then. Yasmin's group is charged with that. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, if I could I'm, just I'm add, gonna Bill. The chance, I'm going to ask the <laughs> chancellor to answer that. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I think that's... Uh, that makes sense. I, I do think one of the challenges we have moving forward is how does our VSCS forward task force and the board um, and the VSC as a whole, um, how do we move forward in, in conjunction with what's happening with the legislative select committee? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Jim Cade noted, it's not yet been approved as I understand it by the legislature, but they had originally put in the statute uh, an 18 month process. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Jim has advised um, you know, the, the legislature and the leaders that that's really too long um, and that we need to be looking at a shorter time frame. But I think we, uh, we collectively, the board, et cetera, we need to not, um, we don't wanna to get too far ahead of what the legislative committee is mm -hmm. going to do because my hope is the legislative committee is going to help identify those priorities uh, that, that Jim Page was talking about in the sense of what is it the state wants the Vermont State Colleges to provide and then getting into the resources. And, and then ultimately, once we figured out the priorities, the strategies we have for accomplishing those, then getting into what does the structure look like at the end, not leapfrogging to conclusions at the end. And I just, I think we have to, um, that's something we just have to watch very carefully um, how that's going to move forward. Cause I'm very sensitive to the fact that we have a legislative committee that's been tasked with, um, it, it has in the statute, it specifically indicates that they should work with um, the internal task forces that we've had. So the VSCS forward task force, and it also lists out NVU and, and BTC's task forces as well. So they should be building on that information. So my, my goal would be, to have everybody, um, you know, working from the same the same page, not not being off in completely different directions. But I know that's going to be something we have to pay attention to moving forward. 
Good. Uh, that that all of this addresses my sense of this. There needs to be a way for everything to come into alignment, mm -hmm. because if it doesn't, we right. will we will not have a endpoint that we're satisfied with. And Yasmin, I think you're going to add something. I'm sorry. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, I, that's, I that, no, that's cut you off. No, that's quite all right. I, the, the piece I would add, Bill, is that we are working with the forward task force with an external facilitator who's really there to ensure that we're taking in all voices and 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 hearing and listening and, and kind of doing a little bit to make sure that that's part of the process. Okay. So. Good. Okay. And um, congratulations, Bill. Oh, yeah, right. Any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, we have a motion on the floor and a second to, um, to take some action on the, the VSCS forward task force, the recommendations to work with the, count, the chancellor and uh, our academic leader. All those in favor, any other questions? None. Okay, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 And opposed? There are no unopposed, and thank you. That's an action item we have now accomplished. We now have a discussion number seven, the uh, adding the Board of Trustees meeting dates for 2021, 20 and 21. Any questions or thoughts on that? Does the Chancellor have anything to say about that that would be helpful for us? There's, we have a normal retreat date in September where we're not going to go to a retreat. We're going to do it probably by Zoom. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a long two days. Uh, we are working on that. Um, and as, um, as the trustees know, we have been contacted. Uh, we're working with um, representatives from across the system with regard to scheduling um, a training for the trustees regarding uh, racial uh, justice, you know, diversity and inclusion issues. So we anticipate that at least a portion of that time will be taken up with that training. Um, so the reason I came back was because historically we've only had four or so full board meetings a year. Uh, obviously, we've been meeting a lot more often than that recently, but it seemed a long time between September and December, uh, given the importance of the work we have to do to go without having a board meeting. And so rather than be scheduling a lot of special meetings to try to deal with things, it seemed it might be more efficient to just go ahead now and identify a date in November, early November, where we could uh, meet as an, as an additional meeting. There is a full slate of committee meetings um, in late October. So it seemed like it would be helpful to have a board meeting after that. Um, and again, we could then, um, you know, depending on what happens, um, you know, well, I'm sure we'll be hearing more back from the VSES forward task force um, and having other conversations about getting direction from the board in terms of, uh, you know, what direction you want us to go in and, and what next steps you want us to take. So that was really the purpose for this particular item. I do have a question and I can, um, you know, work with Mike Buchek as the chair of the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, the next meeting for that group is the 26th of October, which also seems quite a distance away given the importance of the Long Range Planning Committee to the work that's that's being undertaken to, to sort of re-envision the Vermont State Colleges. Um, so I will, you know, work on that as well. But for now, it was simply a request that we meet again in, uh, in early November um, on my wedding anniversary. So it seemed like a perfect way to celebrate. Um, so. <laughs> way to ruin a good day. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm just, um, I, uh, is uh, Michael Pichek still here? Is he departed? He had to leave. Um, Madam Chair. Go right ahead, Karen Luna. Um, just, just a point of history. Um, years ago, we used to have more frequent meetings. I don't recall if they were monthly or a little less frequent than that, but they were, Linda can attest to this. Yeah. And we reduced the number of meetings to replace them with overnight meetings in thought was that we would have more bonding opportunities as a group um, doing it that way. And now that we're going, you know, we're, we're not meeting in person, 
Um, it, I think, and, and with all that's going on, I think it makes tremendous sense to be meeting more frequently. Yeah, that's yes, a good we point. We have a minimum of six meetings. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I vaguely remember that when I first got on the board. Oh, yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, it was every couple of months. Well, one of the things we did discuss at a meeting sometime back in July, maybe, is that with um, maybe about the time that we, we appointed Sophie Zadotny as chair or uh, as counselor, chancellor, chancellor. we we'll get it right. The point is, is that we did talk about maybe under the next few months, maybe the next four or five months, having monthly meetings. I don't know if we need to do that. This is certainly um, whether we need to have the committees do a little bit more or whether we need to have uh, monthly meetings, but special meetings that aren't too long might be easier if we, um, if we just focus on something that we absolutely have to focus on. Uh, we got a lot of things to focus on, but I think that, uh, but one of the things might be something that are more often, but shorter. Is any thoughts on that? Lynn, I'll jump in there. I think more often and shorter, uh, with the reliance on the on the trustees to do their homework coming into the meeting, I think we can all uh, find our way to to do that homework and maybe avoid. It, it does cut down on some of the public opportunity, so that we have to balance that. Um, but if we're if the if the documents are public and we're just reading those in advance and not having to sort of go over them during the meeting, if we're all coming in at the same point. And really getting to decisions versus conversation. Yes, yes. Anyone else have any thoughts? Megan, you were shaking your head. Oh, I agree with that completely. And I apologize. I also have to go in, in two minutes for another meeting. The other immediate thought on that lines is I think we still have one more agenda item, which is pressing around the cool. college reopening plans. That's the restart. Um, yes, and you do have some thoughts on that. Could you just share those with us before you leave? I can. I, I actually think it be it bears a spe a further discussion with the board, um, but I do just very briefly. I would say I did read them all, and I I appreciate and know very well how difficult and challenging finding the balance of of returning students to campuses. But I do think it will be very important for the board to hear um, from particularly our residential campuses on the how they intend to enforce quarantine and enforce student behaviors um, and exactly what the testing regime is because recent recent research has suggested that the the safe prudent return to campus is a twice weekly testing regime which is not practical for our colleges and, and may not be warranted based on um, where Vermont is in the pandemic but I do think it, it merits board attention in the very near future because I think we are we have a, a responsibility to those communities. Thank you. I'm, I, I, anyone else have anything to say? On um, meetings, we can move on if we can. I was just wondering, would it make sense to, to schedule a separate meeting soon? I mean, like within the next week or two um, to discuss the restart plans? Because I know a couple of the colleges, they were still in draft mode and I know they've been working incredibly hard to get this this done and up and running, but it might be beneficial for them as well to delay that discussion uh, for another week or 10 days. If that's, again, going to Adam's point of shorter, uh, more frequent meetings, would that make sense to do it that way? Sophie, if I may, um, I do, I believe students are returning to campus today. Um, so I do feel that this is more pressing than a week. Okay. Yeah, some students have started returning uh, to the campuses, yeah, as of, as of the weekend. It appears we have eight members of the board here. We're gonna have seven in a little very few minutes. Um, yeah. What's yeah. the pleasure of the board? Yeah, the board won't be able to vote with only seven because you, you have to have a, a quorum. Seems like we should schedule a special meeting to deal with that sooner if we're not going to have enough to vote on soon and sooner 10 days seems way too mm -hmm. hate to say it but 10 days seems way too late yeah that's that's fine whatever's the pleasure of the board we'll, we'll find a date sooner than that if that's what you want to do 
I think what's so. Yeah, what's happening Monday? Can they have something for us that's more formal and finished by Monday? Will the colleges have something? I have to wait for the colleges to chime in on that. Um, if there are folks out there that can can say about their plans. Go ahead, Pat. Um, I will just add that the, the governor has recently released uh, guidance as relates to vans and libraries. So some of us are gonna be able to update our plans. I would think for Vermont Tech, we can have them pretty well updated by Monday. Any other presidents? Okay, I, I'm just going to raise a question. I apologize. I, I have not been able to read what has been submitted to us on this, uh, but I have had public folks say to me, why would the state colleges not have one policy? That's another question. I mean, I mean given That's everything we've talked about here today, yes. why, why would each campus have a different way of approaching this? I mean, I don't know that they do or if they don't, and I, I'm not wanting to put, put flies into the ointment, but it's like, help yes. me understand why, why that would be. Yes, when I read through it, there's a lot of a lot of common areas. There's a couple. Well, obviously, CCV is a very different school. Yeah, a lot of commonalities between these different drafts. Um, I think VTC is going to have definite on-campus options for limited students. That's a little different, maybe, than the others. But that is a very good question that I have also heard people mention. So. Just to respond to the earlier question, um, my position at NVU is that um, these documents are kind of living documents and our guidance is changing moment by moment, literally. Mm -hmm. So we are going to have to continually, I don't, when you're saying finished, I don't think they're going to be finished. I think we are constantly evolving as we gain new understandings and new guidance is given to us. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine. Thank you. But if I, if I could pipe in, I mean, we all are opening slightly different than the others. So the plans may be different to the chair's point. We are doing uh, low residential lab weeks for our students. So because the hands-on and applied piece is so critical to them to, for them to successfully complete their education, that may or may not be something. And CCV is doing completely remotely with some very few exceptions. And Castleton and NVU are very similar in terms of some uh, residential options. So, but we are all following the exact same template um, from the governor's office in terms of the college guidance and what the questions we need to answer. Uh, but we have slightly different approaches to how we're doing things. But it, the question is a good one to ask. But can, I'm, I'm just going to. I'm sorry. I'm just going. Does this require board approval? These plans. Why? 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 Why is this My something that's coming to the board? Yeah, my understanding from Megan, um, and maybe the chancellor has some insight on this, is that it does in fact uh, require board approval. So I think Megan, Megan's point is that at other, other institutions that she's familiar with across the country, these plans have, have been submitted to the board for approval. I mean, the challenge is, I mean, we've, the, the college is all presented to the um, executive committee publicly in July, what their plans were, you know, the overall plans. Um, this is somewhat different. I don't know that the board is required to approve uh, the actual restart plans. The, the colleges are required to have restart plans uh, by the, the governor's mandatory guidance. Yeah. Um, as, as President Collins noted, um, nothing's fixed in stone. We're all dealing with this incredibly fluid situation. And one example is athletics, because I think the governor is going to be releasing information about athletics for higher education. Um, you know, we're just waiting on that. It could be this week, it could be next week. So everything, it, it has to evolve to deal with all the guidance that comes down. And even as, as uh, uh, Trustee Kluver noted, I mean, there's, there's new information coming out all the time and the colleges are in constant, um, you know, transition mode of trying to adapt to all the different uh, guidance that's coming out. Um, I mean, your bigger question is more just the, the, the plans in general, right, for, for returning. Um, and again, the colleges are in different situations depending on the particular institution and the needs of their students um, and what, what um, their capacity is to meet all the requirements uh, that the governor has, has put out. So, um, you know, the, there's a spectrum of approaches. They're not 
hugely far apart. There will be extensive remote learning um, at all the institutions, um, but they're, you know, they all fall in slightly different places on the spectrum. Um, and as Pat noted, you know, for BTC, it's obviously critical to get students um, onto campus to deal with labs and experiential hands-on learning that, you know, some of the other colleges have that for some courses, but not to the same extent as BTC. So to me, it's not one size fits all. This is a place where the colleges are distinctive. Um, and I, you know, to me, it's, that was a decision by the presidents in terms of how well equipped their particular institution was uh, to meet the guidance um, and to be prepared to come back in the fall. But again, the whole situation just continues to evolve. I mean, every day there are colleges that have changed their plans for the fall. Um, and I expect, you know, it hasn't been quite the way it was in March, but um, I expect things will continue to evolve and we have to be prepared to pivot to being totally online because that's a, that's a certainly a possibility that that could happen. Linda? Uh, I'm, even if the board is not specifically approving them, it does seem to me this, these, there's a lot of risks on all sides in dealing with this, at the very least financial risks, if they have to all close down again. I think it's important for us as a board to understand mm -hmm. how the institutions are responding to the guidelines and I think it's important for us to understand it, even if we are not necessarily, you know, rubber stamping and saying, yes, this is how to uh, do it. There's a lot of risks and issues out there. David. I completely agree with Linda. We have an obligation to hear about these plans and have an opportunity to comment unquestionably. Um, if that's not today, which I don't think it would be, it sounds like we're going to uh, table this and reschedule, that's fine. Um, I have particular interest um, in hearing from the colleges about how they're planning on testing. Um, I think testing in rural Vermont in particular is highly challenged. Um, we do not have the same access in our rural hospitals for quick testing that UVM MC has and essentially has a monopoly on. Mm -hmm. um, in rural markets, uh, those tests are still taking three to six days, which you might as well not even test because you've got to be quarantined in, until you get your negative. So we've got some, especially the rural markets, which is where most of our campuses are, uh, they don't have access to quick tests. Um, I, I'm a little bit, this is a bit of a soapbox for me, serving on the board of a rural hospital, understanding that our largest hospital has access to quick testing, but there's really a healthcare disparity between rural and urban, not unlike all the other rural versus urban disparities that we have here in Vermont. So I'll pop off my soapbox, but that's a real concern of mine. Yeah, President Collins. Just a response to that question. Um, that has been a concern for us as well. So what we did is we, uh, we contracted with the Broad Institute and we just brought 97 students in over the weekend by, I think Sunday night, I had the results and by Monday morning for sure that they all were um, negative. So uh, they are able to turn the results back to us in a very quick time, but we are not relying on our local hospitals. So it's a different situation. But are those, I'd like to, are those the, what is it, the PCR sort of results that have the more, um, that have fewer false negatives? Or is that some of the um, more the antibody style of tests? Um, Jonathan Davis, are you there? Can you respond to that question? Yeah, it's still a nasal swab, but much less invasive than what you're finding at the hospital. Um, so it's uh, the ones that have the ne might necessarily be having more false negatives, more false positives. Thank you. Okay, would the fact that the template that the colleges are following 
uh, be the same with variations depending on their needs? Is this something that would satisfy us as a, as a board that we're really trying to get? Is that something that's accurate that we can look at as a system-wide examination of this? Taking into account the things that the President mm -hmm. Collins brought up that it's changing every day. Yeah, I mean, I, is that a question for me? It's yeah, that's for anyone, but yeah, you're a good person to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, I will say we've had extensive conversations um, internally about this. Uh, we meet regularly talking about it. Our deans of students have done an extraordinary amount of work and they've really been leading the charge for their colleges and they've been collaborating very closely. So uh, this is one area where, although it may not look like there's one uniform um, you know, approach because the colleges have, have, have different needs and whatever, but um, in terms of the collaboration, um, it has been extensive. Um, we've had tremendous conversations around it. Um, again, the reference to the, the Broad Institute, that's something that, that um, NVU is, is using, uh, but we've been sharing information between the colleges. Uh, one example is um, the use of Castle Branch, which is going to be uh, a way for folks to self attest um, and VTC was instrumental in, in getting that, um, get, sort of alerting us to that and the colleges are agreeing to use that as, as an approach. So there has been a lot of, um, a lot of collaboration around this um, by the, um, particularly the deans of students, but also our HR council our business affairs council and then the council of presidents. So we do discuss these issues regularly about what are the challenges people are facing, how are they addressing it? Um, but I, I, what I'm hearing is it sounds as if we need to get another meeting scheduled um, for next week, um, you know, find a time uh, that works for at least a quorum of the board um, to talk about and have the presidents be in a position to share with you what they're doing with their restart plan. So if that's, you know, what the direction you want us to go in, then that's what we will do. Does that sound fine? Adam, go ahead. Yeah, uh, briefly, um, you know, I th my perspective or my interest in this is, is the, as David said, an obligation to hear the plans, to understand the plans. It's to the, the staff, the faculty, the community, and of mm -hmm. course, the students. I, I have no vision of us providing direct input into the plans. Um, I think it's more ensuring that we have heard the plans and we're familiar with the plans and have the opportunity to ask questions about the plan. But I, for one, don't don't feel if, if it's up for debate that we need to approve the plans. OK, and this may be something that will be revised along the way and we'll be hearing about it hopefully in less detail than we will in the next meeting. So so Sophie, we're going to ask you as the chancellor to go and uh, find some way to go and have us meet next week. Get a survey and make sure we have a quorum and we can all listen to what the presidents and that will be hopefully the only thing we have to deal with unless something else comes up. But um, we could start with that. If that sounds satisfactory to everyone. We're gonna table this issue for today. Yes. Good, okay. So the next thing on is other business. Does anyone have any other business they'd like to bring up? If not, we do have some public comment. I don't know who the faculty member was that tried to speak during uh, or asked a question during Jim Page's or after Jim Page's presentation, but if that faculty member has a question, please feel free to come forward and, and ask. Hi, Lynn. Uh, it's oh. Tyrone Shaw. Okay, hi, Tyrone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, you have the floor. Okay. Um, if I understood correctly, it seems the issue of possibly closing campuses was raised, however obliquely, earlier uh, in this meeting today by Trustee Luna. Uh, this board needs to speak very carefully. Even floating the suggestion could continue to undermine public confidence in the system. And, the, and in NVU and Vermont Tech in particular, both of which were seriously damaged a few months ago by such a proposal. I hope we've learned some lessons from the public outrage and reaction to the former chancellor's proposal to gut higher education in the northern tier of Vermont. At the very least, I encourage this board to strengthen and reaffirm our mission, our system, not to undermine it, however, unintentionally. Lest we forget, 
it's more than a matter of real estate. It's a matter of economic and cultural viability for the entire communities affected and for the social fabric that binds us. It's a matter of aqua, uh, access equity and Vermont's future. I hope that one of the primary priorities of this board will be to advocate effectively for adequate sustainable public funding, not to accept the slow starvation of continued legislative neglect. Thank you. Thank you, Tyrone. I'm glad we got a chance to hear you. We also had Beth Olson, Beth, Linda Olson and Beth Walsh. I think Beth had her hand up first. Is Beth still here? No, Beth had to drop off, I believe. We OK, have... well, Linda, Linda Olson, you're next. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I have a couple of different points based on all of the presentations. The first, I feel like obligated to bring up a point um, during the Title IX presentation, um, Trustee Milne talked about her experience with friends who had falsely accused people of sexual assault. I, I'm not doubting her experience. What I'm saying is I don't want that to be out there as the norm because it's exceedingly rare for women to um, falsely accuse men of sexual assault. The research is consistent. So this is it, an anecdotal uh, evidence does not trump social science research. I would be happy to bring my trained advocates in to educate the board about the issues that are covered under Title IX. They're quite well versed at these by now, but that is not the, the norm or the reality when you look at the research. Second issue is for Yasmin for the VSC Forward Task Force. You mentioned that there should be a consolidation of governance, and I'm wondering whether you meant faculty governance or whether you meant administration, um, because I think you probably meant faculty governance, but uh, I just wanna remind this body that cuts have already been made to the staff, namely 33%, smaller than we were in 2011, um, to the professional staff, 25% smaller than we were in 2011, and to the faculty, 25% smaller than we were in 2011. These cuts have already been made. So if we want a courageous proposal, we should be willing to turn a critical eye on the administration as well, and whether or not that needs to be um, reduced. And finally, I just wanted to say, discussions about um, the return to campus are a bit tardy. <laughs> We're going back to school on Tuesday. Our students are, many of them are already back on campus. Some will be back on, the rest will be back on campus uh, this weekend. Staff has been on campus for a while already. We're already exposing ourselves to these risks. So this discussion, if you wanted a systemic approach, which I would have liked to have seen, should have taken place ages ago. Thank you. Thank you, Lissom. Thank you, Linda. Thoughts well, well placed. We, we are catching up. We do admit that, but we appreciate your comments. Anyone else want to speak? Well, if there are no other public comments, uh, we will be looking forward to hearing from the chancellor and she will give us some information as to when we can sit down and review these three start plans even though it may be a little late, but we do know that they will change as time moves on. So we just wanna be as up to date as we can. Anyone else have any comments? Not hearing any, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, David, move to adjourn. Anyone else? Second it? Second. Okay, is there any discussion? All those in favor of adjourning say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. No, I assume no one's opposed. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate everybody taking the time. Thank you very much. I appreciate your help and uh, understanding while I break in here. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lynn, for stepping in Thanks, and Lynn. doing taking on this role. Okay. Thank you very much to all of you. We'll see you probably next week. Thank you. <laughs>